right? Terry thinks that he was not coming. Oh. Right, Chitra? Yes. So I think we have everybody who said that they were going to be joining us tonight, and we'll, including myself, remember to use our microphones. Uh, <laughs> So we have uh, Chitra here who will be supporting us from the staff side. She'll be taking some great notes. We've got my laptop plugged in and working, which we're very grateful for. And just want to welcome everyone to the October 29th meeting of the North Ventura Coordinated Area Plan Working Group. Uh, you should have before you the packet and the materials that are over there at the table uh, on my left and the right of some folks. And we're going to begin tonight with our call to order and our oral communications. And then the main um, parts of our agenda, we're going to hear from WRA, um, who's our study or consultant working on our creek study. We're going to talk about plan alternatives and we'll also, of course, kick it off by talking about uh, an update from the October 21st, 2019 City Council hearing. And then we'll wrap up our meeting with oral communications and adjournment and talk about um, future meetings and workshops as well. Um, is there anything else that folks would like to say in the beginning? Angela, would you like to talk, say a few things now? We should start with the roll call. Oh, roll call. Sorry. Teacher, thank you for keeping us in order. Okay. Um, Angela Delaporta? Here. Kristen Flynn? Here. Terry Holzema? Gail Price? Here. Heather Rosen? Here. Lance Smith? Yunan Song? Uh, Tim Steele, yeah. Lakiba Pittman, C. Zhang, uh, Alec Alexander Liu, here. Keith Rector, here. Doria Soma, present. Walder Waldemar Karmaski. Yeah. No, he's not here. He said he won't be here. Oh, he said he won't be here. Yeah. That's it. Great, thank you, Chitra. We're gonna hand it over to our co-chair, Angela Del Porta. Okay, thanks, yes, I'm so pleased to see everybody here. Um, and I wanted to just uh, say, maybe it goes without saying, but I wanted to encourage anybody who has any questions or concerns that they would like uh, Gail or me to pass on to the city at any point to please feel free to contact me. Um, by email or by phone. I don't know if our phone numbers are available, but just, okay. <laughs> yeah, but please feel free to, to contact me. A and I also would like to just briefly say, um, I was really dismayed when, when I heard that um, Sobratos was thinking of not doing anything with the Fry's site. Um, and I almost started thinking, well, what's the point of our m group meeting anymore? Why should we do anything if nothing's going to happen? Um, and I realized later that um, regardless, in a way, of what, is, uh, what Sobratos decides to do right now, we have a chance to say what we, uh, as a group, think would be best, um, the best kind of development for um, our neighborhood, and our city. And I think we should take that chance and really use it and we shouldn't feel discouraged or worried or feel that we have to learn all the ins and outs of financing developments in Silicon Valley these days. Though of course we want to be reasonable. I mean our job is to come up with a reasonable, thoughtful, creative proposal um, for the area. And, and I just hope that people don't start feeling discouraged um, even if even if we don't even if it can't happen right away, we should take the chance to say what we think would be best for our community. That's that's it. Great, thank you, Angela. Uh, Rachel, and yes, if Rachel? I can interrupt, uh, we missed the oral communication part of the. We meeting. are well on welcome and housekeeping, so that was part of the housekeeping. Okay. I would consider that just kind of a general welcome and encouragement uh, for our group. Um, one other item on housekeeping, which we can come back to later in the meeting, is just kind of our meeting schedule. So we realized that the November meeting was scheduled the week of Thanksgiving, so um, we can maybe do some calendar checking. I realize that might not work for me and, and my family uh, commitments, and I imagine some of us may be traveling or otherwise engaged that week. So we can look to December, and we'll um, see if we can. We found some dates that may work. We want to poll you guys to see if there's December uh, dates that look better for our group than the November date, but we can um, take care of that at the end so we don't spend too much time in the beginning burning it on scheduling, but I just wanted to, to put that out there so folks can be thinking about it. 
Um, and with that, uh, we will move on to the oral communications. So I believe we have, is it two minutes? Three minutes? Three minutes. Three minutes, if there's anybody. Do we have speaker so we cards, have teacher? One, one speaker card, David Myers. David, if you'd like to yeah. approach the microphone. And if you need the um, podium, you can we can uh, angle that for you as well. Is this okay? Yeah, sorry. I hope it's okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks very much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is David Meyer. I work for Silicon Valley at Home, which is an affordable housing advocacy organization that works across Santa Clara County. Um, I just want to say thanks to all you guys for volunteering your time to do this kind of visioning process. I know it's a lot of time and effort, so um, it's really, really great. I wanted to just share kind of two opportunities that I see related to the visioning process that, that you're working on, both kind of both from a personal level and also kind of from an organizational level. And um, really, on the personal level, it's related to the fact that my wife works at Stanford Hospital. I frequently bike through the North Ventura area on the way, way over there, and it's, it's really striking to me always to see me in the nice Ventura neighborhood, nice residential streets, and then you kind of come out and kind of this no man's land. I know that there are obviously some homes in, in the plan area already, but that there's a lot of office parks. Then you get back to the kind of great downtown at Calab. And so I guess kind of the, the two opportunities that I really see are related to the Caltrain station um, in terms of looking at how do we, as part of this visioning process, think about creating homes and affordable homes that are going to be accessible to that Caltrain station, especially I don't know if people saw a Dean Levin's email to the group that was about how the Caltrain is going to be very likely increasing regular service to this station, which means there's going to be a lot more trains, there's going to be a lot more capacity for people to take those trains and use that as a way to get out of their cars, get to work, um, and really be able to access other things kind of around the valley. And I, I just flag for everyone that, you know, some of you may know some of the other cities are working on their transit stations that are also going to see an increase in, in traffic with these changes to Caltrain. Especially, I think, Lawrence Station in Sunnyvale, which uh, if any of you are familiar with it right now, it's basically kind of like empty lots around it. But because there's going to be this increase um, in service, the city of Sunnyvale and Santa Clara both planning really complete neighborhoods, housing, shops, retail, streets, walkable, bikeable around those areas. And they're really being bold. I mean, the city of Sunnyvale is considering up to 6,000 homes around the area. Santa Clara is looking at 3,500 in their area. And so I guess I just commend that to you as kind of an idea that I think being bold and thinking about how can we use the, the opportunity of the Caltrain station and what that's going to mean, um, both for just giving people of different incomes accessibility to the station and also cutting down on people driving their, their cars everywhere. Um, and the second thing I, I, I would just point out is, is that it's, it's really clear to me that there's this great opportunity to, to really connect the existing Ventura neighborhood, the people who already live in this area with resources that are on Cal Ave and also with new resources that would be part of, of this development. And so, um, you know, I, I think that, that as you look at this plan and as you vision, we don't have to, you know, think small, you can, you can think bold. We can, we can accomplish a lot of the things that we want to, whether it's community resources, parks, housing, shops. I think that those things are all possible in this area when you look at the potential opportunities in the future. And so I guess that, that's just what I, would, what I would, uh, would, would recommend to you all as you're thinking about this, and that the opportunities for housing, affordable housing are great, really for these reasons, making these connections and taking advantage of the, the, the opportunities with the station. So thanks. Thank you. Is there any other speaker cards, Chitra? No. Any other public comment? All right, seeing none, we'll have an update on the October 21st, 2019 City Council hearing. So that was the hearing where we took to the City Council the contract with Perkins Will, which is our consultant who will be, who has been working with us and will continue to work with us. And you may recall that was a item to request ex uh, an expanded timeline and um, increased uh, contribution financially from the city for the project. And so that was heard on consent. Um, it was passed with four yes votes and two no votes and one uh, council member was absent, council member Niss. And we, we will be moving that forward. We will go back for a budget adjustment to the council on the 18th of November. That will actually be the mechanism to move the money that will then be in the accounts to uh, pay for the project as Perkins and Wills working with us, but we have moved forward with the contract. Are there any questions regarding that? 
That's the main update. So it was uncontent. So there wasn't much discussion um, on the item. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, uh, I have a feeling I know someone, uh, one of my neighbors who's going to be asking me, is it possible to see the new contract? Is it a different in any way, or is, it, is there a way of looking at the new contract? The contract is attached to the council staff report. So I can make sure that you have it, and you can share it with them. But the contract's there. Okay. Okay, if there's no other questions, I want to introduce um, Ben Snyder, who is from WRA, and he is going to be presenting about the Creek study. So just a little bit about Ben. He's a versatile engineer and project manager with over 15 years of rich and varied experience in the fields of hydrology, hydraulics, sediment transport, CAD-based design, and project implementation. His leadership and creativity has helped deliver successful projects ranging in size from localized bank stabilization efforts to rich scale to reach scale process based river restoration. I don't know what that is, but that sounds really interesting. Reach scale <laughs> process based river restoration. <laughs> ben has extensive experience in the application of advanced analytical techniques, the design of holistic flood risk management and habitat restoration projects in both river and coastal environments. And he's working also with George Salvaggio at WRA, who is the principal landscape architect there with over 20 years of experience. And George is the project manager uh, for the project. So we're very excited to have uh, Ben here and also to be working with George. And I believe there's another person in the team whose name I've forgotten, but really a wealth of, of knowledge and resources and experiences uh, through WRA. So I'm gonna pull up his presentation. And Ben Thanks, Rachel. will take it started. On. Is it on? Uh, is this on? Yeah, it sounds like it. Okay. I was just too far away. Great. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight and to speak with you about what's possible for Matadero Creek and to begin the process of really investigating how we can make the most out of this resource, which is the creek as it passes through the study area that we're considering, the NV cap area. Uh, I had the opportunity to, uh, to visit the site with Chitra last week. Um, that was helpful to me to start to get an idea of, of um, what some of the constraints are at the site. Um, so in, in, my, in my talk today, I'll, I'll go over what our, our process is. I'm going to introduce um, my team. There's going to be uh, a little bit of a change to our team structure, and I'll get to that, that slide. But um, and thank you very much to Rachel to Chit and Chitra for... Uh, bringing us on board to work on this. I think it's a really great opportunity. So we're going to do the best we can to, to see what all is possible at the site. Um, so you can move to the next slide, please. Um, so George has, um, has been overloaded with other projects and <laughs> will probably not be able to be continuing to serve as project manager. But I get to have the opportunity now to step into that role of being the PM for the project. And um, Brian Bartell, a very experienced landscape architect will be the project director. And under me, I'll have um, my dear friend, Andrew Smith, who I have a uh, long history of working with at the US Army Corps of Engineers, uh, who now works on my team. He'll be doing civil design and hydraulic modeling. And we have another uh, very talented landscape architect, Janice, who will also be doing um, planting plans and helping to develop the drawings that help to tell the story of um, what the different design alternatives will be at the site. So just to step through what the six different aspects of um, our approach will be, to start out, we want to really get a clear picture of what the design plans can be. And the way that I see that unfolding includes a clear definition of what the problems are at the site, what the opportunities are, what the objectives are, and also the constraints. So really, working with all of you and um, other members of the community to get, an, uh, to get a clear definition of those four very important things, the problems, opportunities, objectives, and constraints. Um, and so I think we're starting to do that in the process of um, hearing you all and my attendance here tonight and my discussions with Rachel and Chitra and other comments from the community. I think that's really helpful for that planning process because that's really going to help to drive what types of designs we're going to try to fit into this very constrained space. Um, the site assessment portion of the, of the project, we've begun by reviewing the documents and um, other project assets 
that have been provided by Palo Alto and by, uh, by Valley Water. We had a really constructive meeting with them last week and they expressed some of their, um, their ideas about the project to us and agreed to provide some really useful project assets including as-built plans for the creek and the hydraulic model that they use to evaluate f um, flood risk for the creek. Um, so after we move through those first couple of phases of defining what the plan is, what we're seeing, what's is possible, and looking at what all we have to work with in terms of drawings and modeling, then we can really start to sketch out what some of these different alternatives can be. And so from our preliminary discussions th with the city, we've already kind of established what a range of these alternatives could be, ranging from essentially a no action alternative, where Matadero Creek basically stays as it is now, to something that's a complete renaturalization of the creek that makes it look like we picture natural creeks to be with vegetation and cobbles and gravel and um, essentially habitat for fish and aquatic species and riparian vegetation. Um, and there'll most likely be at least one or two of alternatives that fall somewhere within that spectrum that um, create a compromise between habitat and aesthetic value and recreational opportunities and cost. So once we start to define what some of those alternatives are, then we'll use hydraulic modeling iteratively with that design development process to evaluate whether those design alternatives are feasible based on the constraints of the system. Uh, so I won't get too far into the weeds with all the joys of hydraulic modeling, which I, I enjoy very much, but basically the engineers who do the modeling work closely with the landscape architects to see what's possible and what isn't based on the constraints that we identify in the planning process. Um, and then continuing with the process is to develop drawings, conceptual drawings that show what these alternatives look like in plan view, so basically from an aerial view, in cross section, and in profile, and describe how the new project could fit into the constraints of the system. Um, and finally, ongoing coordination between my team and the city and the community at large. Uh, slide, please. Um, so from our initial site assessment and speaking with, with Valley Water, there are a few things that are, are clearly going to be um, challenges that are arising out of our beginning of the planning process. Um, flood control is of critical importance as, this, as it is now, Matadero Creek uh, is a flood damage reduction project. Uh, it's designed to safely convey the 100 year flow event or 1% annual chance event um, and it's, it's clear that um, that, that level of, of flood control is going to need to be maintained going forward. Um, the site also must be easily maintained by, uh, uh, accessed for maintenance by, by Valley Water. Um, there are several ramps that go down from the public rights of way down into the Valley Water right of way within Matadero Creek that Valley Water uses to access to remove sediment and debris and, and maintain this nice, smooth, rectangular concrete channel because as sediment builds up and debris accumulates in the channel, the flood conveyance goes down and then the system will not meet its flood control objectives and that is not acceptable to Valley Water and also to the community who prefers to stay dry during flood events. <laughs> Um, safety is, public safety is also a concern which ties back into um, flood control in some ways. Um, but also we, we want to look at uh, what's possible as far as, as habitat goes. Um, is, this, is there a potential for this creek to be valuable for steelhead trout, um, which are definitely of, of interest to, to many Bay Area creeks um, and were once plentiful throughout, um, throughout the Bay Area. Uh, and also aesthetics. Um, 
it's possible there's room for improvement um, <laughs> compared to <laughs> the existing channel. Sorry, Kristen, Kirsten, oh, Kirsten, can you use your microphone? I know it's odd because sorry about that. Wrong direction. <laughs> um, is an objective to recharge underground aquifers? That's a, a good question. And that is actually not an objective that I had considered yet, but I think that that should be included in our, our planning. Because um, groundwater overdrafting has historically been a major problem in the South Bay. So definitely want to include that. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, slide, please. Um, so once once we get to the stage where we're evaluating different design alternatives, um, these are some of the things that I've thought of early in our process that we'll be wanting to consider um, based on our conversations. Um, flood conveyance, and we'll use hydraulic modeling to evaluate that. Uh, also, sediment transport is something that could be of concern as a, a maintenance issue. Um, if we change the hydraulics of the creek, we're also changing sediment transport continuity through the system. And that's something that we want to be conscious of as we're evaluating different designs because we don't want to create a long-term maintenance issue with our new project. Um, and that ties into channel stability. But um, in channel stability, I'm thinking more in terms of not what's happening with the bed aggradation or raising from sediment deposition, but with the banks being stable and not falling into the channel. Because one of the really um, beneficial things of a maybe not so aesthetically pleasing concrete channel is that um, it, it is pretty stable. Um, corridor width is possibly a metric to use for, um, for some habitat value. Um, and also really important, I would imagine, to the city and the community and probably the developer would be uh, the cost of each one of these um, different alternatives. What is that pipe on the left-hand side of the picture? That's the top of the fence. That's right. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm kind of pulling <laughs> the camera <laughs> over the it top. It looks like a big pipe far away. <laughs> Thank you. Can, can I ask, too, for the sediment transport, do you want it to transport sediment? We don't want it to, or to sort of take that into your model calculations of how much sediment gets transported away each year, or something like that. We would we would like the sediment transport capacity to be roughly the same as it is now. I see, Tim has a question. Yeah, from where to where of the creek are we studying? From well. Just downstream of, of Park, um, where there makes a, a 90 degree bend. I don't know if I have a, an overhead, an aerial view in my slides, but um, where the 90 degree bend is where the boundary of the NV cap study area polygon is, um, upstream to Lambert. So Lambert would be the upstream end. But in discussions with Chitra, there are some opportunities to potentially tie in additional stream naturalization upstream of Lambert. So um, the exact definition of the, the limits of where we'll be presenting and developing design alternatives, I think, is still being determined. Because I, I would like to see as much of Mat this section of Matadero Creek be renaturalized as, as possible. And it seems like there are some opportunities at Bulwar Park upstream and the recently acquired parcel just upstream of Lambert, um, is that 3350 Birch? So, um, yeah. Um, so, I was speaking a little bit earlier about how much I love hydraulic modeling. And uh, <laughs> this, this is a, an example of some model output. It may be a little bit difficult to see, but I'll try to just show you what I'm looking at here, especially because the writing is very small. But what this is, is a view of Matadero Creek uh, from the side. This is a longitudinal profile of the model output. Um, and what this is showing is the, the predicted water surface elevation relative to a few bridge decks of interest. So um, the most downstream one, the flow going from right to left, from high to low, 
the most downstream one is is the Park Bridge, and then Lambert. Uh, yeah. No, sorry. This is. Can I suggest if you just take the microphone out of the stand, then you can point because I don't know if we know where you're talking. About. Okay. So here we have uh, Alma Park and Lambert, and um, what you see there is the water surface elevation as it kind of backs up against those those bridges based on the modeling that we have. Um, and this is a model that I received that was from um, an earlier study by Schaffen Wheeler for Sobretto um, based on modeling for the FEMA flood insurance study. Um, and so what we can do is, is use this model to test some changes in the geometry of the channel to show how this water surface elevation goes up or down based on the things that we propose to do to change the geometry of the channel. Um, some of the things we would change are the shape, the size of the, the cross section. Um, next slide, please. Oh, that's a good question. The, the red line is um, critical depth. That's where the, that's what the that depth of the flow would be if it was super critical. Um, <laughs> it does. Um, and the, the, gr the green shows that's the, um, the energy grade line. So that includes the velocity head of the flow. So that's the, um, basically, if you were to stop, like slow all of the water down against some kind of obstruction and take all of that kinetic energy out of the flow, it would go up to that green line. The blue line is the water surface. So that's the hydraulic grade line. Um, and um, the the term critical depth, um, so maybe getting in a bit into the weeds to try to define during this this meeting. But um, there are two <laughs> there are two energy states for any certain type of of flow: subcritical and supercritical. Supercritical is very low and fast, and subcritical is um, slow and and deep a fascinating aspect of, of hydraulics. <laughs> um, it, I could go into you two more after maybe I'm off, offline. <laughs> um, but I probably probably didn't need to include the red line on there because it's probably not of interest to the general public. But <laughs> it, it doesn't mean critical, meaning of critical importance to the community. Like Correct, okay. yeah. So <laughs> Is there a line on this page which if it went above it, we'd say, oh, that's too deep or something, or is that not really how we read these lines? Um, not on this particular output, but um, it can be plotted, uh, it can plot the, um, the top of the bank, and then that okay. can clearly show you, oh, the water surface is higher than the ground surface, and that means it's going to start that's pouring the out the side. Yeah, that would be critical. Yeah, that would be critical, yeah. <laughs> Um, so this is a, just a real quick adjustment that I made in the hydraulic model from the existing condition. I, I said, well, what would happen if we just laid this bank back? So this, this is a cross-section view of the model. So if you're looking downstream, you're, um, let's say, in between Lambert and Park standing down in the channel. Um, and so instead of having the um, vertical bank on the left, now it's laid back at a two to one slope, um, but you still have the one to the, the vertical slope on the right bank. Um, so this was just, you know, just kind of seeing what would happen. Um, and another change that was made to the model is, is the, the roughness. Um, if we're not having a nice smooth concrete channel, then we need to account for that in the model by changing the, the roughness value. And so it basically doubled the, the roughness. Um, and that increases the water surface elevation by changing the geometry and by, by changing the roughness. So that's going to be one of the um, constraints and factors that we have to consider as we're evaluating what's, what's possible at the site. Um, if you 
I'm not sure how visible this will be, but if you go back to the previous slide, please. Um, there's one section where that change in geometry was applied, and that was between Lambert and Park in this one model run. And you can see there's a blue line. Uh, I, and I, I promise I'll have better visuals next time you see me. <laughs> but uh, there's the higher blue line. That's to show the scenario where the cross-section area is increased and the roughness in is increased for, for that section. So, um, so it's going up like by about a foot. Um, uh, you know, questions about the profile or section views or hydraulics, cr critical flow? <laughs> okay, uh, yes ma'am. My question is, when I was first viewing this, I thought, well, it's getting wider and therefore has more capacity, volume capacity. And the only explanation for what you said about the water going up is means, no, it's not getting, it's the top edge is where it used to be and now it's going in this way at the bottom. Is that correct? The, the controlling Is my question clear? It, it is, thank you. Um, uh, to, to me at least, and um, the the critical factor here is the roughness in the channel. So since we're essentially doubling the roughness to account for larger rocks and vegetation and more and more natural, that's what's causing that that increase in water surface. Um, a couple of other things that will um, increase the backwater, uh, increase the depth of flow, is expansion and contraction of the flow. That takes some energy out of the flow. Um, so when the water has to converge to go back underneath of the park, then that's going to cause some, some backup. Right. Um, slide, please. Um, so uh, based on what we're finding out there, just to summarize some of the things that we're looking at, Matadero Creek right now, it's a very basic rectangular concrete channel um, designed pretty much for, for one thing, and that's to, to convey flood water through the neighborhood. Um, and it does that pretty efficiently. Um, there is not really any riparian or aquatic habitat at all because of the material forming the channel. Um, there is one small low flow channel um, that was um, that goes through this the center and allows for a few inches of flow during the summer months. Um, this is a somewhat a subjective evaluation, but I find it to be aesthetically somewhat uninteresting. Um, and I, I believe there may be some safety concerns related to just the, the height of the walls. Um, it could be a, a, an attractive nuisance to people um, to potentially vacancy, people making murals and doing things like that. It's not, um, yeah, there may be some roof room for improvement there in terms of safety. Um, something I'm seeing from the modeling is that it looks like there are hydraulic controls at the bridges, meaning what I'm, c I'm kind of hoping to see in my modeling is that we can make some adjustments in the cross-section geometry in between the bridges in that those bridges will be causing so much backwater themselves that they're allowing us to do some things upstream, if that makes if that makes sense. Can you restate that sentence and maybe explain mm. some of the words you use in it? Yes, I'd be happy to. Um, when I say hydraulic control of bridges, um, the bridges themselves may be acting um, to limit the amount of flow that can pass under them because they, um, they kind of act as a, like a, a, a big valve for, th for the creek. Um, and if the water surface is already under existing conditions higher than the bottom of the bridge, then that bridge may be backwatering the flow to the point where the things that we propose to do in the creek will have less of an effect than what that bridge is already having. 
Is that more clear? Okay, thank you. Um, there are a lot of access ramps that are in the channel um, and in the valley water right away, which are going to have to stay there, I think, in order to be able to have valley water on board with whatever we propose. Um, so those are fairly significant constraints. Um, low flow habitat I is, has, is clearly of interest. Um, it was of interest enough even in the 70s for there to be a low flow channel through the um, through the larger concrete channel, we would want to be able to to maintain that uh, low flow habitat. Um, a pretty large constraint is um, the private property owners along the corridor. Um, just downstream and to the left of Lambert, there's a section of private property owners, and then um, downstream to the on the right side between Lambert and Park, um, there's a number of parcels where. Ideally, I, sh I should say, in the ultimate renaturalization scenario, we're um, working with those property owners to renaturalize that entire corridor, but those are um, significant constraints that would have to be negotiated as the um, process goes forward. Uh, slide, please. Okay, I have a question. Yeah. Yes. Terry, can you try to use um, Doria's mic maybe? And that's a little awkward sure. position. Yeah, quick question. When the, when the flow goes down the creek like this, it makes a 90 degree turn. Are you studying what the impacts are for naturalization in terms of, does that put more pressure on that 90 degree turn? You know, when that, when that creek turns and then flows down the rest underneath the railroad tracks? I mean, is that part of the study that you're doing? I mean. We, we do take Sorry. into account the momentum loss in the flow as it hits that 90 degree bend and turns. I think because of the, the constraints of where we're looking um, as far as the property boundary goes, I don't know that we'll have much of an option to, to straighten out the creek through there. Um, I would love to discover that that's not the case as we move forward in the planning process. But um, as far as I've been able to tell so far, that 90 degree bend is, is here to stay, unless we could acquire a number of other properties that are well beyond the edges of the NV cap polygon. Maybe to follow up on that question, does that turn pose a, a, a barrier in terms of naturalization, in terms of the water has to go a certain speed in order to go around the curve and therefore the things we do upstream you know, need to maintain a certain Momentum, or I'm not sure what mm. it would need to. No, look at no, would be an impact, right. okay. so. How how's the slope of that this portion? Uh, if you get rid of the concrete and now just have dirt on the bottom, will you tend to have erosion, or is the slope flat enough that it won't get as much erosion? That's that's a good question, and we'll be working to to evaluate that um, as part of our sediment transport analysis. Because we, we would like to have a situation where there is not erosion or significant deposition where it's a maintenance issue, maintenance, maintenance issue through there. Yes. Do you have to take into account climate change um, when you're considering flood control? I mean, do you have to change the amount of flood control that you're planning ahead for because of that? That's that's a really good question, and um, that climate change, as far as our prediction of of future precipitation intensity, is beyond the scope of of our analysis. Um, as we have more studies that are well supported in order to change what our future estimates of the design precipitation intensity are, then we'll incorporate that into our analysis, but we don't foresee that being a part of this particular project. 
So just to say what we'll do now, it, we'll have time for continuing to have Ben for questions. And then maybe, Ben, you can wrap up by just when we finish our Q&A portion to kind of the next steps, because um, I know you guys are going to come back again to our group in the future. So uh, I see Gail with a hand. And if folks, I'll try my best to look around and make sure I catch you. But um, it's OK just to turn your mic on and, and ask Ben the question. Thank you. I appreciate your presentation. Angela asked one of my questions. I have two more. Um, considering it's early in the process, I recognize that. Is it conceivable that whatever the alternatives are chosen to be, that this phase of the subject properties, this you know particular area, could be implemented prior to implementation of other phases of the broader subject NVCAP properties. So absent the question of funding, could the recommendations that you may be making be implemented as phased and brought in earlier than other opportunities in the subject site? I, I don't see why not. OK, great. And the other quick question is, um, just to clarify, are you maintaining the cement or concrete lining concept in all alternatives? No. No. And so my question is, um, if there are plumes in the vicinity based on earlier manufacturing toxicity, uh, would that be a consideration as it impacts the habitat? Yes, I believe it would be. Um, and actually, I think. In our, in our scope of work, it, that is actually laid out as one of the things that we'll need to consider is a vapor intrusion zone. Um, so one of the things I'm looking, looking for um, in our really planning and site assessment process is information related to the vapor intrusion zone. Um, my understanding is that there may be some sort of a delineated polygon already that shows where there's um, some plume data. So that would be really helpful to have. So Thank you. Great questions. Thank you. Uh, Gail, I didn't know if I understood that first of your questions, oh, yeah. not the one that was okay. asked by Angela, but on, on, the, on the question about whether the improvements could be implemented now in advance of other items, I, right. I, I still believe that we may have a constraint with land ownership. And of course, any private property owner constraints might also uh, you know, impede being able to move forward with a sign, uh, not just funding, but also land. Thank you. I'm going to remain hopeful, but I understand what you're saying. Uh, do we have excess throughput at this portion, or uh, no, water throughput? Uh, ex ex excess flood conveyance? Yes. No. No, okay. it doesn't, doesn't really appear so based on the modeling that, that I've seen. Um, I do anticipate getting the official up-to-date model from Valley Water this week, and that should show if there's any excess capacity. But um, So the goal is to maintain the current conveyance or to improve it, or what's the? Uh, to maintain the, the existing conveyance. OK, the thank goal. you. Yeah. Are there any questions from the working group? Well, maybe we'll do is if there are some public comment on this item from members of the public, they might have some questions that they can voice during that, and then we can gather those. And uh, if the working group would like to entertain those questions being asked, we can do that. So if there's public comment, uh, you can get a speaker card. You can also spill the card out later if you haven't already, um, and we can have you ask the questions at the microphone where Ben's standing, and we'll get those down. Um, hi. Um, yeah, I've uh, I've said this previously in one of the NVCAP meetings, but now that the creek and so on, <coughs> excuse me, now that the creek and so on is here, I'll, I'll say it again. Um, in the uh, the '98 flood, um, the the creek did not uh, hold the amount of water that was flowing through it. In, in fact, what happened was that the 
um, the pipes going in to the creek from the drains, the, the flaps closed up on those, and so the water backed out of the drains. And so the, the area flooded to uh, a substantial depth. I'm sure Lund knows about this. Um, so, you know, to say that the creek current capacity can, you know, is adequate, I, I don't think that's correct. In the city documentation, that 98 flood is described as a, an 80 year event, not a 100 year. And that was in 98. I think it's quite disturbing that there's no consideration of climate change. I mean, you know, look at what's going on around us. Y you know, that maybe that 80 year flood in 98 was, would be a 50 year flood now. But, you know, I'm not the expert. Thank you. Would you like me to one more speaker and then if you can respond afterwards? Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so it sounds like you um, are not, um, but I, I do encourage you to not feel constrained to stay within the current creek channel width. Um, I would say the original creek wasn't in that original channel. Uh, and then humans without manners essentially stole from the creek and its inhabitants to create more parking and property space. Uh, so uh, the NVCAP project will surely have open space and park requirements. Uh, and so some of that could potentially be met within a wider creek channel. Um, so it wouldn't really be a loss to property owners to have some of that park land to be part of the creek channel. Um, and then as you noted, the city is purchasing that empty lot uh, at the corner of Lambert Ash and at Chestnut and there's the adjacent Woolworth Park. So I think that's a great opportunity to um, to have uh, people engage with that creek um, and really uh, get to experience the natural um, treasures that we can have in our community and get them more um, engaged with um, the ecology of, e ecology of our space. Um, and then also um, I went to a great uh, a water uh, themed uh, workshop um, uh, a month, uh, a week ago, um, last Monday, and um, one of the things they were uh, trying to do was increase summer flows to support fish habitat when the flow gets really low and um, farmers were taking out um, water kind of at a, a difficult time for the ecology. And so you might consider that, um, you know, uh, we might be harvesting rainwater from the site and um, we could potentially be storing that and releasing some of that into the creek in the drier months so as to support the habitat. So thanks for your efforts and I support uh, full restoration. Thanks. Thank you. Ben, you may have, I didn't hear any specific questions, but if there was anything that you wanted to address, uh, maybe especially regarding just the flood waters and kind of 80 or 100 year floods and, and kind of how we might be making sure we're preparing for such events. and how your work or the work of general kind of hydrology plays into uh, understanding that. Yeah, um, thank you. I appreciate uh, both of the those comments. Um, regarding the, the 1998 event, um, and I, I know very few of the details um, about that particular event um, other than, than what you've just shared, um, but one of the things that you mentioned was that the the gates were closed that drained to the creek. Um, and that's typically the case um, for the way that those flap gates work is they, they stay closed until the flood water recedes um, and then the those interior areas can drain. So there can be some interior flooding in parking lots where the storm drain system is, is overwhelmed until the, um, the flood waters can pass through the creek. Um, so that's just one of the unfortunate ways of um, that it has to, has to be plumbed, essentially, the plumbing of the system. So that may have actually been functioning the way it was um, supposed to, but it does bring up um, uh, greater um, concern of just all of the parts being maintained and operating correctly. 
Um, sometimes those flap gates just get jammed and they don't open when they're supposed to. Um, sometimes debris collects on bridges. Sometimes debris collects um, in, in those pipes and gates and that's um, something that is in essentially Valley Waters um, jurisdiction to, to maintain um, the drainage and the, the conveyance of the system and so we want to work closely with them to make sure that they can do their job to maintain um, all of the, the flood conveyance of the system, including the, um, the drains that, that go to the creek, um, because that's, that's something that we don't, don't want to overlook, is how our new um, beautiful renaturalized creek would then tie into these other infrastructure features, the drains from the parking lots and um, other neighboring communities. Great, thank you. Um, and then I guess, are there any more questions? <coughs> Kristen, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, I, sorry, I made, I made to speak to the other, the other point about, um, about how um, precipitation intensity is, is changing. Um, essentially, all um, we as, as engineers can go by right now are the most up-to-date um, hydrology studies which are based on rainfall records which are um, updated with some regularity. Um, I believe the most recent um, precipitation intensity, um, like official values for what we say is the 1% you know, chance precipitation event, I believe was updated within the past five years. Um, and so that would be utilizing um, pretty much all of the available data to define what um, magnitude these rare events are, um, but that does not take into account future variability, um, and uh, that's just not something we're prepared to be able to defend from an engineering perspective yet, but I, I do share your concern that um, what's happening with climate change is um, increasing variability and, in, and um, intensity of uh, these weather events. So. Yeah. So, my only question, and I always seem to be asking the same question, is if is there a place you would point us if we want to get up to speed so that we can be intelligent consumers of your reports and um, presentations, like educational resources on the web, that a primer perhaps on hydrology and creek design? Um, hmm. I you can convey something to the city, and then the city, I'm sure, would convey it to us if you, I don't want to put you on the spot right at the second. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for the question, and if that can be included in the minutes as a, an action item for me, I'd be happy to follow up. So, thanks. There's a lot of great information out there. <laughs> yeah. Great. And then, uh, Keith? Do you envision your designs to encourage people to go down into the stream or discourage them? Uh, to encourage people to, so to interact with the creek. You would right. want, like, in the, in the park area to have kids to be able to access and play in the stream. Uh, I would definitely like to see that in um, at least one of the alternatives. Um, you know, re recreation access, I don't know that I list it out as one of the um, planning items, but I think that that's definitely what counts uh, um, as an opportunity here, is increased recreation increased public interaction, community interaction, and enjoyment of, of the creek. Um, we, um, in river restoration, we speak a lot about habitat um, for steelhead, habitat for red-legged frog. Um, but I, I'm also really interested in building habitat for, for the dominant species um, in Palo Alto. <laughs> um, and I think it's really important, too. Any other questions? Do you want to tell you a little bit, Ben, about, um, I know you guys have some plans to come back to the working group at certain points and just kind of, I, I know you listed out the things you're going through, but just kind of what we might expect um, to hear from you next time you come back. So thanks. Um, next steps will be continuing to, to digest the, the existing um, information that we're gathering incorporating the vapor intrusion information that we hope to be receiving soon and the latest hydraulic models from Valley Water. Um, and then beginning to, to lay out um, what some of these designs can, can look like. Um, I'd, 
I, I would encourage you to, to voice what some of your ideas are as far as um, what we should be considering in our planning process and those, f those four things of what we see as, as problems, opportunities, objectives, and constraints. So that when we're moving forward with trying to scope what's going to go into these different alternatives, we're taking into account what the community sees as being the most prominent of those four items, and problems, opportunities, objectives, and constraints. Um, so I don't want to overpromise, but I believe with them um, by next month we'll have some drawings to show of what some of the different, um, at least some what some of the features of the different designs um, could could look like. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Is that, right. is that all? Yeah, I think that's everything. Okay, Thank you. great. So uh, with that idea of the problems, opportunities, objectives, constraints, it's something we can, now we have a little bit of information, maybe we'll get some more education we can be thinking about. Um, and Maybe you, you can send me an email. I can have Shichir send a reminder. But um, if you have notes you'd want me to pass on to Ben of, oh, this is a big opportunity I see, or here's a huge problem I'm really worried about. We already heard about some tonight. Um, obviously concerned about floods, climate change, how does the creek get restored, um, how do we work with property owners, so we know some of them, but if you have specific things that are on your mind in terms of those problems, opportunities, objectives, and constraints, um, please let me know and I can make sure that the WRA team has those and that we also share it with the other members of the working group. Okay. All right. Anything from you, Jonathan, on the flood, uh, the, the creek? Um, study before we move on to the next item? No, just thank you for coming out and, and sharing your initial information with us. I think it's very helpful and I appreciate all the comments from the working group members. So we're going to switch PowerPoints here without losing connection to the TV, hopefully. We'll see. Uh, all right, we're still in the game. Okay. Okay, so the next item on our agenda is item number three, um, which is thinking about our plan alternatives and elements of the plan discussion. So I want to thank first Gail and Angela for meeting with me and working with me over the last few weeks um, to think about the agenda and to think really carefully about how we might have an engaging and interactive uh, evening, so we're going to try some things this evening. Um, we hope to get your good feedback, but also your willful participation and trying to put your best effort forward as we work to uh, to work together. And as I am stepping into this role um, without Elena, so we miss her dearly. Uh, so tonight we're we're going to focus uh, probably a lot of our time and energy on um, ideas around housing, the urban form, the density of the housing and population we want to see, as well as some of the mobility considerations. The materials you'll be, lo you'll be looking at will be hopefully familiar because they come from some of the previous meetings that we've had this year. But we're hoping that what might be different is providing more time for discussion, for feedback, for hearing from everyone, and making sure everyone's voice is heard throughout discussing and kind of engaging the materials. In addition, sometimes when you sit with things for a while, you have different ideas than you might have had when you very, very first saw them. So um, hopefully we've learned some things, we've had some more thoughts and discussions, and so you may have fresh uh, opinions. So with that, uh, we're gonna wanna kind of just uh, share with you what I'm hoping that we will be able to get from this evening is to offer the working group members an opportunity to discuss aspects of the North Ventura coordinated area plan that will be addressed in the three plan alternatives. So you can think about the three plan alternatives having different amounts of housing, different amounts of open space, and so again, different types of ways to connect and encourage mobility to and through the site. And so that's what we wanna get your feedback on. Uh, maybe there's some things you'd really love to see in a plan alternative or things you don't really care about as much. Maybe there's divergence that um, you and a working group, another member might disagree, or convergence that everyone kind of says, oh wow, this is really something we'd like to see. So we're hopeful that we'll see some of those so that we can work with the um, Perkins and Will team to make sure that those aspects are incorporated. So first we're gonna review the plan um, goals and objectives just quickly that um, we have. And then uh, the two main items are the urban form density and height and mobility. 
Um, and then, you know, we, you may even have some more thoughts about the creek as we kind of go through this, um, and we can add that into the discussion as well. So these are the goals adopted by the Palo Alto City Council on March 5th of 2018. Uh, and there are much longer description, which is also in your packet and in the cover letter. But the seven goals were housing and land use, transit, pedestrian, and bicycle connections, connected street grid, community facilities and infrastructure, balance of community interests, urban design, design guidelines, and neighborhood fabric, and sustainability and the environment. So one of the ways I want to encourage us to um, evaluate and understand the plan alternatives when we see them and as they're developed is how well do they meet these goals and objectives, or these goals rather. It could be that different alternatives meet different objectives to a greater or lesser degree. And you know I don't think we'll probably get a 10 on every single one, but we may say, you know what, we want to get a 10 on this one and a 7 on this one because there's kind of a bit of a trade-off between them. So that's kind of the thing that we'll be wanting to explore. So these you can keep these in mind as ways to evaluate a plan, in, in part because plans have a lot in them. If you have looked at any of the area plans that we've sent, there's a lot of detail and a lot of pages and sections, and so how to kind of sort through to think about, well, do I like this or do I not like this? Um, or how does it meet uh, the goals that we have stated as a city? Some of the project objectives were to have a data-driven approach, a comprehensive and user-friendly document, so we want to hopefully be accessible to our community when they read it, guide and strategy for staff and decision makers, we want the project to be meaningful, have meaningful community engagement, to be economically feasible, and to support the environment and public health. And then lastly, just a refresher on kind of some of the components of the combined, or sorry, the coordinated area plan. We're gonna talk about that it's gonna, the, the different alternatives that we'll see will have different distribution, location, and extent of land uses, so you can think about is it for parks, is it for retail, is it for housing, the different ways that we in our zoning code break up our land uses, which tend to be um, some, some larger buckets, could be arts uses, et cetera. Two, distribution and location and extent of intensity of public infrastructure. So again, we're talking about the creek, we're talking about roads, we're talking about public um, items and where would they be located and how would they function. Program of implementation measures, so it could be development regulations, so if we think often it's not just about how tall is a building and how many units are there, but what does it look like? How does it interact with the public street and with the community? Public works projects and financing for those. We're gonna look at design and development standards, again, thinking about how do things look. Determination of economic and fiscal feasibility. So those are the studies that we are gonna be doing with strategic economics to understand how feasible are the different plans and ideas that we have and what would it take both to make them work from a financial perspective and also what might they yield economically that could be benefit, that could be steered into some of our public benefits. And lastly, there will be environmental review of our plan document. So urban form. So what we want to first do tonight is we have, and we sent out as part of the cover letter and teacher has for you, um, the cities that each of you sent in that were your inspiration. Um, that were the cities that you wanted to see. So we have these questions here. Uh, identify some of the images and the housing and building types and what do you like. What are the characteristics of these buildings that you find attractive? What are the heights of some of the buildings that you find attractive? And what aspects of the urban form in these areas are most attractive to you? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna pass um, them out. We have some for you to share. You may already have them. I see some people have theirs from before. Thank you for recycling your previous packets. Uh, some people have it electronically. I see Gail's very tech savvy. She's got it on her tablet of some kind here. Uh, so you may already have that. And then we're going to break up into groups of three to four. I think with our numbers tonight, we probably can do groups of three. Um, so you could just, you know, with the three people who are closest to you. So take a minute just to jot down what are your own responses to these questions. I know some folks it's easier to think a little bit. Then we're going to have time to share in your group, and then we'll kind of report out and have that first um, discussion. So Chitra, if you can help to pass those out to folks, and some folks can maybe share with each other. Um, I was very conscious to try not to waste a lot of paper, so I do apologize for, for that, and hopefully people can cooperate. Oh, sorry, I, I 
realize every time I go between things that it blacks out. Do you guys think that yeah. so three, 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 and two? Or was there one for two? No. Three, 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 two. Tim, Tim. I was like, I was somebody, I was like, there's somebody else here. Who's, who is it? So maybe Tim can come over here with you guys. That'd be great.
okay as you're continuing to work? Maybe a few more minutes and be sure to think about, again, what are the character buildings, the heights, the forms that you're liking? Okay, we're going to do two more minutes of discussion, two more minutes in your groups. Okay, one more minute, and please think about who you want to have report out for your group. One more minute. All right, so time to wrap up. All right.
right, everyone, let's come back to a group discussion. We have a good problem, which is everyone is talking a lot, which is great. Okay, I'm gonna start calling people by name. Alex, Lun, Heather, Tim, Keith, Gail. Okay, there we go, that's working a little better. All right, so what we're gonna do is ask the groups to present. Okay, everyone, let's have one conversation. I know this is, like I said, it's a great problem that we're all talking, but we'll kind of bring it together to a group conversation. So what I'd like to ask is for each group, we'll go around and have everyone say, you know, maybe one or two minutes on what your group discussed. Um, you know, maybe focusing on, again, what you found attractive, what were the things that you like, with an eye of what you'd like to see in the plan alternatives. Um, so why don't we start kind of down at this end of the table, we'll go around, and then you guys will be the group to wrap it up, okay? So, Alex, did you guys choose who would report out for your group? Is it you? <laughs> How is this gonna be recorded? How, like, people's preferences and everything? Is it all just recorded, uh, I don't know, by some kind of recording device, or is it minutes or how so it is recorded we are being recorded you're being recorded um <laughs> and what will also happen is the the notes are transcribed from the audio recording and so um they're very extensive uh, notes of written of what everyone says so perkins and will will be getting all of these reps. absolutely in addition to you know i'll take my own notes but those are not going to be as thorough as the transcriptions okay so we like the uh, like we like a mix of historical and new buildings, and so the projects that we were looking at were the um, Edinburgh and Pearl District and the uh, the yards in DC. Uh, I think we we discussed like retaining existing buildings, and then that may meet, require the um, housing to be taller if we're, if we're preserving some of the existing buildings. So we were looking at like the four to six stories. Um, I think we like the for the larger buildings to be near parks, an open space, or like on a boulevard. Uh, we actually like a, a variety of, um, of building types and styles. Uh, we actually like, we also like having um, a lot of balconies on buildings. Anything else? When you say variety, you like that in a certain place there would be various types within the same place, or you just like a lot of types of buildings and they all looked attractive? Yeah, so I, I think I had one comment, which is like on the, on the DC yards, that it looked a little over, overly master plan. We have like one building on one block, and it's just, it gets, to me it gets monotonous. In Pearl District, you have like a lot of different varieties of, um, of buildings mixed together. Are there any questions from other groups to this group? Any curiosity or question for this group from others? And then, Lon, uh, Heather, do you guys have anything to add? Great, thank you. Okay, and the next group, who is going to present? Angela, are you reporting out for your group? Oh, uh, this group. Okay, yes, I am. <laughs> so sorry, <laughs> I didn't realize it was so quick. Okay, um, so we liked the height of about three to four stories. Uh, we like a variety of heights, and we wouldn't even mind having um, somewhat higher buildings in the middle of uh, the site where they aren't sort of looming over the sidewalk or over um, single family homes. Um, but uh, we don't want terribly dense housing um, if it means that we won't have enough amenities like parking, schools, shopping, and that kind of thing, those kinds of things. Um, we do, we would like to see uh, rather dense housing because it will promote more affordable um, housing for middle income families. Um, we love seeing sidewalks and seeing bicycles prioritized. Um, we love seeing walkways without cars. Um, we love seeing, yeah, I think I said prioritizing bicycles. Um, we love seeing mixed use uh, and retail especially and lots of activities to do in the neighborhood and specifically a communal er area for gathering that has some kind of a draw that isn't just kind of th there without anything going on. We love seeing things going on. Um, we like seeing uh, roads designed to avoid cut through tr car traffic. Um, and we love seeing the designs and the colors on the uh, 
the crosswalks, the, the sort of bright, interesting designs. Did I cover everything? Okay. Great, so I, I was jotting that down. Um, really appreciate you guys taking the time and thinking through that. And you guys, one of the things you mentioned that uh, piqued my interest was wanting to have more housing for middle income families, that being a value of why you'd want to have the housing be, be part of your neighborhood. Do you have anything else you guys want to add about that or how you thought about that? You don't have to, but I'm just curious. Any other questions or comments, things that stuck out to other groups as they were listening? Anything that you ladies would like to add? No. <laughs> okay, awesome, great, thanks. And who's been reporting out for this group? I am, so we had some similarities with the other groups. We really liked the scale of Emeryville, Greenway, Oak Park, Illinois, Russian River, Brewery, and the Barlow. We like the way most of those places, Emeryville Greenway is new, but most of those places had examples of adaptive reuse of old buildings and um, new buildings that were mixed in, used a lot of it, uh, tried to echo the existing architectural forms. We liked, um, I guess we sort of liked three to four stories most, and when it's four stories, we like retail on the bottom and apartments above. We like varied roof lines and varied architectural styles, so it doesn't look like a subdivision. Um, varied roof lines. In all cases, we really appreciated seeing ample open space, parks, plazas, setbacks, just outdoor usable space that we could see people in. And um, we envisioned this area, unlike downtown Palo Alto, we envisioned this area to have more open space and setbacks than uh, downtown Palo Alto, and a more residential character, even though a lot of mixed use. Does that seem right? Mm -hmm. so I, just, but I just want to point out this particular picture from Emeryville as being one that what I found extremely compelling because- The one on the bottom or the top, which one are you? Yeah, at the bottom here, because it has uh, a concrete pathway for a bicycle, uh, a, um, I guess decomposed granite pathway for uh, uh, pedestrians and then green space that would be functional with benches and little areas to gather. So um, I just was extremely compelled by that image. Great, thank you. You guys also sounds like you're looking at some of the pictures of downtown Palo Alto and kind of thinking what would be the difference between this area and downtown uh, and noting that it'd be the more open space setbacks and you said something else that I didn't catch. A more residential. Residential. Okay. Questions, comments, feedback for this group? In your hand? Okay, great. All right. Our last group. Okay. Um, a lot of our comments are similar to others, so I'll try to move quite a, kind of quickly. Um, we had various examples from the, um, our the favorite images. Uh, I'll just reference the Cambridge examples, the, um, the Pearl District of Portland, the St. Anthony, Minneapolis example, San Antonio Center, Oak Park. And um, we didn't have a consensus feeling here necessarily about height because we, there were a variety of opinions uh, from focusing on existing buildings and doing a kind of a reuse approach and looking at architectural features of existing buildings in the um, subject area. And then we also talked about the importance of new design, new buildings, a variety of height, design, setba setbacks, uh, building materials, um, the idea that design highlights the form and the function uh, of the, uh, the various uh, properties. Uh, there was a strong emphasis on uh, the importance of having open space and landscaping, um, and the importance of separating the peds and the bikes and other non-auto mobility um, as much as possible. That's one of the reasons the Greenway concept was, um, I think, very important. Uh, and there are a lot of examples where they even allow, they have provisions for scooters and other, you know, skateboards and others uh, that can um, 
have their own safe path and not be um, causing any problems and risk and confrontation among the various uh, modes of transportation. Um, there was a feeling that we didn't talk, I'm doing a couple of editing points, we didn't talk about the, uh, the size of the units. Um, that certainly informs density, so uh, that's a question that we as a group will have to look at. There was a strong emphasis on social areas, marketplace, market areas, town square kind of concept and plazas. Uh, we, w we like to have the kind of the human part of this so that there's a sense of community. It re relates to the broader Ventura community, uh, recognizing that people come and go because of the jobs that are in the region, that kind of thing. And the landscaping, again, that can soften the hard edges of the buildings. Um, variety of buildings, a variety of heights. As I said, we talked about one story or two story, and then we talked about four, five, six, seven stories. Again, the design, the setbacks, all of that, those are important variables. Um, and there's a recognition that to create more housing, uh, there, may have to, there may have to be some buildings that have greater density. So that's a quick summary. Uh, some of it is similar to what other people have said. I'm sure we'll have more time to discuss all these. Thank you, Gail. And just, you noted that I think some groups had maybe some consensus for their height, that you guys talked about everything from one to seven stories, it sounded like and um, kind of that there's a variety of factors that might influence whether you like a taller or shorter building. Is that kind of correct? So it kind of depends. Sorry. Favorite planning answer, uh, it depends. <laughs> so uh, thank you everyone. Any questions or comments or feedback for that group? Or anything that Keith and Tim that you guys want to add? Okay, great. So um, I know that Again, we're kind of looking back at some images that we had looked at before, but again, for my benefit, it does help me get in touch with, with all of you and your thoughts on these activities. And we're gonna move, kind of use this to move into a discussion a little bit more around, specifically around density um, in the area and what kind of is our housing density specifically. So housing density, and this may be repeat, but you know, it's always good to make sure we're all on the same page. The way, way we talk about housing density in planning is dwelling units per acre. So you might see that written as DU slash acre. So how many dwelling units are on an acre of land? You can imagine, um, and Gail and uh, Angela sent out a great kind of little primer around density that kind of helped to understand how different scales, like you see a subdivision, how many dwelling units were in that acre of land. And as the building um, buildings take different shapes, and different forms, you have more dwelling units, apartments, houses, whatever that unit of dwelling is, in a given acre of land. So that's one way we can think about um, the density. You can also think about population density. So in the document that you had right now, uh, it looked at all of those different neighborhoods, the Pearl, um, downtown, et cetera, and kind of said how many people live in every square mile. So that's a different way to think about density. Um, part of the reason why we talk about dwelling units per acre is because when we're planning for how many units can fit in a place, we don't necessarily know how many people will actually inhabit that. So once we have those units built and people are living there, then we could say, well, this is the number of people that are dwelling within you know, the square mile or, or the unit of measurement. But until they're built, people are living there, and we have kind of the data of who's living there, what we do know for sure is how many units um, are allowed in that acre of land. Jonathan, anything to add from your experience about this? My reaction to that is that that seems reasonable, but if you had a two bedroom or a three bedroom or a one bedroom, that could really vary. And so dwelling in by itself may not be the best uh, measure. Yeah, certainly you can get more specific with, you know, how many one bedrooms, two bedrooms, three bedroom studios. And what we can also know and kind of think about is we might have medians or averages regarding how many typi people typically dwell in at the household, for example. So I think the average for Palo Alto is 2.4 persons per household. And so we can use some of this information um, to try to project what we think might happen. But just to say those are two different ways to think about, about density population and then the housing density. Did you have something there, Sam? I just wanted to make the point that it seems like from all the feedback that we've received, either 2.4, um, we 
do not seem to be designing a project for the typical Poalto density um, of 2.4. It might be very different. There might be more single people. It seems like that's what we're targeting. So maybe that wouldn't be the metric that we would try to focus on. I don't know. And when you say it seems like we're focusing on single people, has that been a conversation point that we've had in yeah. the group or just? We've gotten a lot of public feedback that there is a great deal of pent up demand for that kind of housing. I see. Thank you. If I might add, though, to that is uh, a one bedroom is going to handle, or a studio is going to handle um, one person, if you will, whereas a two or three bedroom is going to handle more. But the volume of the space the unit takes up is smaller. So on an acre basis, if I have all one bedrooms, I get more units, but I might get the same amount of people than if I did just two bedroom units oh, because they yeah. take up more volume of space Sorry. but in a lower density. Yeah. But there's more bedrooms or yeah. the same amount of bedrooms at the end of the day. So okay. a better way exactly. we'd like to count, which then translates the parking, is how many bedrooms you have per project or per unit oh, okay. uh, or, per, or per project on an acre. So we got bedrooms, units, people. Um, and I think we can kind of make sure that we kind of, as we're working together, we can hopefully, as we're reading things and consuming, we can kind of keep in mind, well, how is this document talking about it? How is this report or whatever, you know, talking about it? Jonathan, anything that you'd like to add about how we think about these things in Palo Alto? Alex? So I've been reviewing um, a lot of the ARB projects that have come before the board and looking at the number of units in them, and it really varies wildly, and that's partly due to unit size, where we have a we have one very small unit project, but we also have all these penthouses downtown, um, and which are like 6,000 square feet or more. Um, and then the other factor is that we have mixed use zoning, many parts of Palo Alto, and so that takes out, takes out half of the volume um, for commercial for, for commercial uses, and so we're not getting that many units in the buildings. I'm I'm th looking at a, quite a number of buildings where you just get like six six units or ten units in a big four story building. Thank you. So does that make sense to folks? Kind of what Alex is saying. I think it it's, uh, becomes more important as we start you know in, in the part of the planning process where we're refining you know, how we are measuring our density, but it kind of becomes important throughout so that we're not saying just high density, low density. Those terms are, they're not maybe as meaningful as thinking about, well, how, how many stories are we comfortable with from an urban form perspective? And then kind of who are we trying to serve, which then goes to Tim's point of bedroom mix, unit count, things like that, versus just saying it's 100. Okay, is that a lot of units, a little bit? It, it really depends on a number of factors that influence how does the building look and how does it, it perform. So we just kind of want to break down some of these parts that make the whole. Gail, did you want to say something? Yeah. And uh, I know it's been said before, I mean, the whole issue of economic feasibility is critical um, because at the end of the day, that's, that's one of the many things I'm looking forward to is to understand more completely what are the economics of these various options, design, size, height, setback, et cetera. So, um, and it really is, I mean, unit size is really critical and there's, and the issue of parking ratios is sort of a moving target too. The field itself is in the process of transforming itself in terms of parking per, you know, various units of housing, so anyway, thank you. Yeah. Sorry, really quick, just to add to that. So in the packet, and thank you, Gail, for providing these examples, um, just to point out a specific example, um, 200, this is more of an extreme case, 205 dwelling units per acre. Can you hold, well, let's get to that page so we can look yeah, along sure. with so you. Yeah, sure, so this is page. I don't think there's a page number, but it, you can kind of see, guys, it okay. has these little um, listings, headings of the units yeah, per yeah, acre, yeah. and he's looking at the 205 units per acre of the article that was shared. And I think that's a good example of how these things play out because this is 205 dwelling units per acre. So even though it's an extreme case on, in terms of density, yeah. it's still a four-story building, um, 41 studio apartments, so they're only 4, 430 square feet. 
So even though the dwelling unit per acre seems crazy high, if you actually look at the, at the mm -hmm. specifics, 41 studio apartments, 430 square feet, only four, four stories, and it only provides eight parking spaces. So the parking is important too. Is it underground parking? Is it surface parking? That has an, has an impact. Yeah, I think just to follow up on the point, the part of the point of this article is to try to help, I think, provide some background just how sometimes planners will be talking about um, the units per acre and then how that can look. Because it doesn't mean that there are 205 units in this building. It just means that if you kind of put that building over an acre, how many units would be there? I mean, you guys know that. But just to say it can sound like really high, but it's, you know, breaking it down to that specific plot and how that looks. Sorry. Um, the other point that I think this building brings up is that um, this obviously is not a full acre worth of 205 units per acre. And if you have a few well-designed, and I, the point I want to bring up is that I keep saying good design solves problems. And it, it's a nice, well-designed, intense uh, density building in some areas, then it'll free up our ability to design other things in other areas. Absolutely. Dory, did you have something? I th maybe I just saw your hand move, but. Um, <laughs> I do think it's important to remember moving forward, um, since we don't anticipate pricing to go down in Palo Alto, um, the people are going to, larger groups, larger families will be li living in smaller and smaller buildings also. So I think we should keep that in mind. Absolutely. So we're going to play a little game here. I'm going to see if this will work because it, it is a um, quiz that one of our co-chairs shared with us. And what I think, though, happens is when I switch to the Internet, it does not show up. So let me just take. So I don't know that this I'm going to be able to get this to work in a timely manner, unfortunately. Oh, here we go. Hold on. One thing which came up a lot when I was looking at um, density is that setbacks and stepping is super important, stepping up. So I'm sure that's those are going to be two concepts that we're going to have to spend more time on is um, – what kind of residential setbacks are the minimum required to get that residential character rather than a more of an urban uh, up on the sidewalk street character. Great point. So I mastered the technology. Um, <laughs> thank you. So this is Silicon Valley at home. Uh, this is, you should, you should probably be giving this uh, presentation um, since this is your wonderful tool. I know, right? Don't cheat. You don't. You can't tell us the answers. Okay, so this shows about, I think there's nine, 12 um, different buildings. And so we're going to guess the density. And then what I'd also like to do is just kind of use this as a, uh, these images as a way for us to talk a little bit more about the, t the types that we like and what we like about the form of these different buildings. Okay, so we're going to start here in this building. I don't know how many units there are, so I won't say it's a five. home. Okay, we got a five. Anybody else? Any guessers? One, this one here with this uh, beige white. Oh, per acre or per, per, per How is it? Lot? Per acre. I think right. it's the units per, per acre. acre, yeah. And but then it will tell us how many is in that particular okay. development as well. I, I 
We got five. Anybody else? Six. Oh, six. Okay. Anybody? <laughs> All right. Going once, going twice. Fifteen. Eight. The first one. This one here. Fifteen point three. I do have candy, actually, so we could do a prize if you wanted. Um, <laughs> It's the property on that on that on that parcel on that project site. So they're able to put trees and gardens and everything in there. So it includes the whole project site. So that's fifteen point three. It's called the Classics at is it Nagley Park in San Jose? All right, next one. I think I can unselect it. What do we think about this one? Twenty. Okay, she's she's learning from the previous one. <laughs> Anybody else? We see some. I see Pat's nodding at 20. 25. Okay. Going once. <laughs> Going twice. Ooh, 15.6. So only just a little bit more. And this specific development is 15.6 units the acre, but overall it's 145 units. So you can imagine it's spreading out over some space, um, over 10.2 acres of land. It's difficult to tell just because it's one front image of a, of yeah, a park, yeah. so I don't know kind of how there uh, is it's laid out, but it's probably what we might call garden apartments, where there's green space and then kind of uh, apartments arranged we around. We don't know about the parking for that, or, and it doesn't look like mixed use. We we don't know yet. There's no there's no there's no ground floor retail. That's for sure, at least. We don't know if there's anything else in the in the site though. Could I ask a oh, question? Oh, I revealed it. Sorry. Could, <laughs> could I ask a question? Uh, yes. Dave, is this... Uh, Do you know about these th pictures? Uh, I'm trying. <laughs> okay. you know, Can you come to the microphone? Sorry, I know we're putting you on the spot. You had no idea that this was going to result from your attendance and giving public comment. So my question is uh, the Eden Housing. Historically, uh -huh. they primarily provide affordable housing. Yes. So it's a non-profit developer, correct? That's correct. Yeah, this is an affordable... I, it's 100% affordable development. So all those homes are deed restricted, which means that you have to make below a certain income to be able to qualify for them. Okay. So yeah, so that, that that's a great example of what affordable housing this one here. looks like yeah. <laughs> in, in the community. So awesome. it looks like all their housing. Surprise, surprise. Thanks, David. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we had, s any guesses on this one? 16? Oh, you, oh, I showed it, so yeah, it's 16. Someone was looking. Uh, <laughs> so this is the gardens, uh, North 9th Street in San Jose, 44 units over 2.8 acres. So we'll scroll down a little bit. Um, and what about this one, Monte Vista? Looks like maybe there's some commercial, I can't tell. Maybe it's just signage. Mm -hmm. Any guesses? 32. 30. Okay. 44. 44, okay. And that's actually an old cannery. Oh, so it's yes. a reused cannery. A Del Monte cannery. Oh, nice. So it's 128 over five acres. Yeah, roughly five acres. Mm -hmm. Madison Place at Monte Vista, San Jose. So you can all, and if you're interested, you can you know, look these up and find out more, more images of them. Uh, here we have a nice playscape. Looks like some maybe three-story brick buildings in the background. Any guesses for this one? <laughs> okay. Beat me down. <laughs> 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 What's difficult is that we can't see how much green space there is involved in the whole. Uh, so well, we can look at floor plan. See how big the whole development, development is. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. when we test them in the past, how often we see cars coming in and out of everything. Mm -hmm. So. I think the idea is that the that this similar typology would would be repeated, and so if you think that this three-story building, so for example, if this was a mansion, it'd be you know one unit per acre because it'd be on a giant lot or something. But um, you might say, well, how many houses and units do you think are in this this portion of it? And then the total would be a sum of that. Yeah. So you can kind of think if that's spread out, what do we think the density of the units is? Because the density per unit if it's repeated, it's going to be the same, no matter how many acres density it gets spread acre. out over. Yeah, density per acre. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, I guess I, I would just say that I think the idea is you're trying to show that uh, like people here in Orange Park and around here is that you can, like, it's units per acre are not like a lot of apartment in the middle, but if you look at all these really different housing types, you can really focus on design in the community and show for any particular amount of homes that something that 
Thank you. So this one is 23 to the acre. And I think I think that's I think that's near a light rail station. Uh, uh, this particular one. Yeah. And then the next one we have 41 units to the acre. Gish Apartments, 35 units total, and then 0.85 acres. So this is kind of a probably more in an urban area. So then we have affordable Gish, housing. Gish. Point eight five acres. Mm -hmm. So it looks like they provided a recreational space here um, through the balconies. So there's some commercial here. It's okay. Is it okay? Yeah. So we'll just kind of go through the rest of them. This one's here. It looks like about roughly three and four story building, and it's forty nine units to the acre. So this is for city apartments in Santa Clara. And 40 units total on 0.81 acres. So you can see it's nice in that it's right up to the sidewalk and, and very kind of inviting uh, to the sidewalk without overwhelming it. So what is the other storage in the apartment? Oh, really? This one, no parking? On the left? Four, Low parking. This one, this one here. And then the middle, we've got kind of a more of a, maybe a tower structure. Huh. 150 units to the acre. It's called the 88. It's got 197 units total on 1.3 acres. So. No, it has a large open space oh, about halfway up the building. What? The courtyard? It's like got a rooftop, I but think, no, right here, maybe. No, right, right here. This here? This little it's deck? It's or up here? Oh, oh, really? Oh, how exciting. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of Phase two is not there. No phase two. No, and he's going to build phase two. Right, but there's a lot of green open space. In this one? Nope. 88? Okay, we'll have to Google map it later on to see where the open space is. <laughs> All right, well, we'll move to the last few examples. Last few examples. This one is 189 units to the acre, so that's probably the highest density one I think we've seen so far. It's a 213 units on 1.1 acres. So again, probably more of an urban one, but you can see they've broken the building up by having this kind of lower part here and then a taller tower. Can you use the mic? Sorry, Tim, that just helps our recording. Then I won't say anything <laughs> truthful. <laughs> the, this building was originally built it's, um, as a condominium project. As it was being built, the market fell apart, just like the 88. They were built about the same time. Yeah. It's very underparked, and it had a real trouble selling also because of the parking, and they tried to secure parking off-site to supplement it. And then it went in default, and then an apartment buyer bought it and converted it to apartments. Wow. Quite the saga for behind these buildings. All right, the last... The last three here, what do you folks think about this red and blue building? It's definitely striking. 176 units to the acre. That's so affordable. That's affordable. Okay. Hey, that's 60 units on a third of an acre. Mm -hmm. So if you built that density out of, well, we don't necessarily know what's there, um, but we can see that they have some balcony spaces. I can't see what's here in the front. So this the, mm -hmm. so that's, that's, you know, again, if you kind of built this out so over that, that would be. Mm -hmm. All right, this last one, any guesses? People learning or feeling like they don't know, they know less than they knew before. Yeah. 60, okay, we got a, a guess here. 80, 100, 204, 204 units. I was more on the 60 mark. Half an acre by Midpen Housing. Another affordable development, 100. Small units. So 102 units. And does anybody know the parking on that? Low. <laughs> affordable projects typically are low. And then the last one, not, not usually no, zero, no, usually lower. Unless it's seniors. 200. Seniors are almost zero. It's true. It's a different, a different, different planning environment. So this is 265 access, a total of 329 units on 1.24 acres. Ownership so. for condominiums. So some ownership project there. That's San Jose, right? How many units yeah. do we have in West Central? 
The project area site is 60 acres overall. Obviously not in one property owner or one parcel, um, but that's the total project area. So again, this is just to try to help to think about the, the interplay between the form that we want our buildings to have, the amount of the, the amenities we want to have, and kind of how that might look in our um, project area, depending on the densities and heights and the different variables that we kind of in inputs and constraints we put onto um, the housing that we might have uh, in our in the NVCAP area. So I know it's 7.30. Do folks need a break? Are people okay? We have like one more hour scheduled the meeting. Okay, we'll keep going. All right, just wanna make sure. So I pulled up some of the densities of some of the projects that are in our area. Um, two of them, the, lo the lower two are in the entitlement process. The first one is, is a constructed project. Just to, again, try to ground out our understanding of, of what we have, what we might have. So 195 page mill, which is constructed, uh, it's that image that's there at the bottom. It is uh, built at 34 units per acre, 34.9, with a total of 85 units. Um, 3225 El Camino, which I believe is the Foot Locker site, um, is 5.52 units per acre, and that's eight units total. And then 423, 441 page mill would have 10 units per acre, and it's a total of 16 units. Kirsten? So I believe some of those projects include other spaces. No, they're all mixed. They do mixed have, use. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit challenging to think about this because th these as examples because they don't include, you don't include the square footage for the office or commercial space. Well, we don't include it in the dwelling unit count, but it still, I think, is just trying to understand when we think about the buildings that we are having or that may, yeah. you may have seen or that are there, um, now, in the case of the 195 page mill, just to try to give a sense of what are, what currently is there or what has been proposed through the process. So certainly, the um, having a retail space changes the building and how much space is available for dwelling units. If your ground floor is retail, you can't have maybe apartments there. Does that have ground floor retail? Just the 195 page mill. Yes. You know, I mean, it's I'm built, but it's not it occupied there's by retail. There's just one cafe. Yeah. And then the rest of the ground floor is R&D. So there are use? some other uh, non-housing uses that are there. Mm -hmm. So office people commuting in and out, basically. There, there's, mm -hmm. a, I think, a point to two good projects to look at if you locally. Um, so one is University Terrace. That's on California Avenue. Um, it's the old Facebook office site. Um, and they, they, Stanford built two condos, two condominium buildings there, and that's RM40, so it's all, I, I calculated the density, it's like 40 units per, or it's a, yeah, I think it's 34 units per acre. And where is this again? So it's on Ca Cal California Avenue, near the Research uh, yeah. Park, oh, way up at the, park. yeah, okay. up, up at the high point. And then also, if we look at, like, south of Forest, here we have the, um, this is the Woodmark, and everything in there. So those are two condo projects. Uh, I forgot the names off the top of my head, but we have the but Woodmark, yeah, and, the, and then there's the senior housing, and they are at uh, RM40, like 40 units per acre about. I, cal I roughly calculated them um, last week. Um, and so, they're typically like 1,500 square foot units, two or three bedrooms, um, two parking spaces per unit. That's really good information for us. I'm jotting that down as fast as I can. Um, I will try to. I can make. I'll try to make a list for you guys, because I, I I need to do it for the ARB as well. Great. Well, appreciate you sharing your homework uh, with us. Um, and then I just put in here the second bullet point is. Uh, one of the data points that our consultants gathered when they were speaking with stakeholders, including the affordable housing developers, and what the developers were talking to them about was about 120 dwelling units per acre is what they are seeing as viable for constructing their 100% affordable projects. So it's just a data point that we can use. It doesn't mean that's what we have to do to have housing, but it's something that we can take into consideration as we're thinking about it, especially in light of seeing some of those um, 
120 dwelling unit per acre pro pro properties, you know, having some of the st design that we might find favorable and still being able to make sense for the affordable housing developers to create. So how do we again strike that balance? One. What is the proposed density for the project at the corner of El Camino and Page Mill? Um, <laughs> Windy Hill is doing. Future, do you remember that off the top of your head? Is that the parking that's parking right? Yeah, for about sixteen units, and almost exactly the same size proportion of it on the other side. So one hundred twenty per acre, exactly. about. And then for the fifty percent of the acreage, so something around that magnitude. Okay. Thanks. And we can find that for you, but I think Doria, I'm sure, remembers it. Remembers it well. <laughs> we can get the we can get some information if people do have curiosity about different properties as well. Also, I'll share with the group, I have a list of existing Palo Alto housing projects. There are probably 25 or 30, and it gives you density per acre or number of units. So I'll send that to you, yeah. and you can send it out. For the group, yeah, we're happy to do that. The other item that Chitra has put together, which we can pass around, um, you can take a look at it, is a catalog. Did you bring it down, Chitra? Yeah. Yes. Um, is a catalog of every parcel. Chitra, do you want to say a little bit about what that that document contains so folks know um, they can look at it and we'll also make it available online because again it's quite thick but it's a great trove so of this information. Is a 270 page uh, uh, book I prepared. Basically it has, um, I have divided the whole project area into blocks and you know one, two, three, four and I, then I, the, by blocks I mark the parcels up like you know n numbered the parcels up and then so these pictures are with the zoning of the parcels mm -hmm. on it and then what I prepared the first uh, table you see here is actually the uh, cataloging the owner the APN number the zoning the com plan designation so all information of uh, parcel by parcel <laughs> So, if you're so the, we, we, that's we, we, block by block. Mm -hmm. I divided the whole uh, area into seven blocks. So I have that. And then uh, the second portion, uh, so then after that, I have a parking requirement table, um, which uh, shows, tells you by zoning what is the parking requirement. And also I have uh, listed the allowed uses by the zoning. So this book contains everything. The next part of the book is called the parcel catalog, which is by parcel. Uh, this is like the parcel report map from our GIS system. So by parcel, uh, the characteristics of the parcels are there. If it's in a flood zone, you know, what's the maximum uh, number of uh, square footage you can build. So that's, that's kind of um, parcel by parcel. And at the end of each block, what I have prepared is a potential development table, like, you know, based on the lot size and based on existing zoning, how much can you build? Meaning, like, if it's a CS zoning, if it's a service commercial, it, uh, what, whatever uses it allows, meaning residential, non-residential, or mixed use, how much square feet can be built? Mm -hmm. And what is the dwelling maximum potential dwelling units that can be uh, m uh, fit in there? And also I have um, uh, two other columns which are all, of course, um, not, I mean, these are static now. Uh, if any projects are under cons construction for those parcels, mm. and then I have another field over there if, if these parcels belong to the housing inventory side, if that's, if the uh, site is on, on our city's housing inventory list, then what is the realistic dwelling unit capacity that can go in there? Mm -hmm. So number of units that that is realistic. So this would be um, up on the web. So that so basically yeah. gives us all. And if folks yeah. if, if folks do prefer hard copies, you can let us know. Take a look at it. Again, just trying to be conscious of paper. If you don't need a hard copy and you prefer electronic, we don't want to make a bunch of, of copies that folks need, but. You know, I myself do enjoy flipping through things. You can see I have a bunch of paper here right now. So no no hard feelings if you do want a copy, but we have those for you. So thank you, Chitra, for all that work. Again, kind of letting us know what the status quo is and where we're starting from. So it's really great information.
and I ask her questions that are in it all the time. And she's like, well, it's right here. Um, okay, so we're at 7, 740. I'm mindful that we want to also go to mobility um, and not have to shortchange that conversation. One of the things that I, I had prepared for us to discuss in small groups was, again, something that you guys had talked about previously, which was there were um, kind of these different typologies that Perkins and Will had presented, again, going back to April, where it's kind of a townhome typology, and it's this many dwelling units per acre, and it's this height, and then some images. And then it's you know a multifamily of this height and this many dwelling units per acre to kind of try to round out this discussion. But if folks would prefer, we can move to the mobility so we can have more time for that, or we could do this last kind of housing discussion. I just want to be be mindful and the mobility items didn't get to get talked about previously and I would hate for that to happen so again could we just make the preparation the this documents from Perkinson will available to us and for us to peruse on our own and then move to what question would you like us to th be thinking about or to answer and I can send the the discussion questions that were for this part which is kind of thinking about these kind of they had laid out essentially three to four different typologies and so kind of thinking what would you like to see and if there's different locations you'd like to see them. So for example, I know that um, Olive and Pepper Streets, we want to be mindful of the single family homes there. So maybe we feel more com comfortable with a two story building being across from a single family home versus a seven story, let's say. And so just kind of thinking about how we might think about both what we prefer, but also if location kind of influences what we prefer. Maybe on Page Mill, a taller building seems more appropriate than, you know, uh, again, by the single family. So that those are the questions. So we can send this out and people can think about it so we can have some of the mobility discussion tonight. I'm seeing some heads nodding, but go ahead, Keith. I have just a quick question about, when we talk about the heights, is there best practices for transitions from single family to higher buildings, or is it just whatever people want to do? Uh, I would say different folks are of different minds about it. Jonathan, I, you might have, we have our own practices here, and then we have designers who might um, kind of think about, about it in a different way. Maybe Jonathan and Alex want to give a response. Yeah, well, I think our code does set forth some transitional standards that are sort of baked into our um, development standards when you're adjacent to um, lower density housing or, or um, you know, one, two story dwellings. And so, um, but the idea is it's a transition. Um, at, uh, you don't necessarily want to go from a low profile structure to a stark, you know, five story uh, building. So I think that's the concept. And um, beyond that, of course, through our review process, we can refine that even further. But I think the push here as we think about sort of w way down the line um, in this project when we're developing standards is we want to be uh, clear and have uh, objective standards more and more. I think the state is kind of pushing us more toward objective standards and, and less from these findings that are more subjective in evaluation. So um, Alex, any further thoughts on that? Or? Just a one comment, which is on, say, like on El Camino. So I think we, we on the ARV get a lot of comments that people don't like the big, long walls on El Camino. Um, but you can go to, so if, so if you're down to the next city down, on Los Altos, they actually will push the, their buildings back um, and not make the transition to the ranch houses behind them. They just push the building back so that the El Camino gets the greater frontage. But in Palo Alto, we're sort of pushing them against closer to the street, so that we get more transition to the houses in the back. Okay, that's very important. All right, so we're going to move on to think looking at um, some of the mobility improvements that were suggested on April seventeenth, and so we'll kind of be thinking about a couple things. There's a, a series of slides we'll go through. And then we'll want to keep these questions in mind. We'll introduce what the what the improvement is, and just have a real quick minute to talk amongst yourselves about the impacts and advantages of that improvement and disadvantages, and then discuss together. So, time for folks to work a little bit quietly, and then um, come back together. And I know that some of these, my understanding is some of these uh, improvements, some folks are supportive of, some folks are less supportive of others, and just kind of a variety of of thoughts. So I'm just going to navigate to those pages. Um, 
me see if I can make it much larger. Okay, so yeah, if you're on your um, document from April 17th, if you happen to have it, um, page, 11. <laughs> page, 11, page 11, yes. And I think I might have one or two hard copies if anybody is preferring that. In the first page, you have the first well, could I go over what's on it? And then if you have thoughts, you can jot it down and kind of share with each other. I'm just mindful of the time it being about 10 to 8, and we want to still have public comment um, uh, before the meeting concludes at 8.30. So these are some of the considerations that were, you can see this is a zoom out of the project area. Um, El Camino Real, Oregon Expressway improvements, Oliver, Olive and Pepper traffic calming, Portage Avenue improvements, site parking considerations, Park Boulevard improvements, and site access and internal connectivity. So then the, each of these next slides goes through kind of a little more zoomed in of those areas and potential solutions and improvements. So starting kind of up in the upper right, study bike ped crossing at Ash Street. So safety, traffic, and cost concerns would need to be studied as part of how to get people to cross at Ash. It's been noted that's a frequent place where folks want to cross the street, but there's not a crossing, uh, well, there's not a signalized crossing right now. At the El Camino and Oregon Expressway, kind of page mill intersections, improving bike and pedestrian crossings at Oregon and El Camino, and study new right turn lane from El Camino onto Oregon. Uh, there's also a new right, and in in, in improvements already planned are in the lighter blue. Uh, there's a new right turn lane at El Camino to Page Mill that's proposed as a safety improvement, and a new carpool lane on Page Mill west of El Camino that's uh, part of the Santa Clara County Expressways plan. Rachel, should we be writing these down so we can talk about them? I'm going to leave this up here. Okay. Uh, we're, we're, so we're going to leave this up here. We'll talk about this page, then we'll go to the next one so that we don't have to try to remember things. So why don't everyone just take a few minutes. You can jot down to yourself and then maybe talk with your neighbor if you see the advantages, disadvantages of I've, any of these proposals. And focus on the ones that are in the blue, the darker blue. Those are the ones that are being proposed, whereas the other ones are already planned. We can have opinions about them, sure, but let's make sure we're kind of addressing the things that we might put into our plan. So thinking about the crossing at Ash. Um, a right turn on El Camino in Oregon, and then uh, bike pet improvements at Oregon and El Camino. You also might have questions you want to get answered. I may not be able to answer them tonight, but I want to take them down so we can incorporate those answers into the responses that we can get. So again, thinking about what do you like, what questions do you have, what are the improvements or advantages or disadvantages of these improvements.
Okay, so I just will open the floor up for folks to share if they had advantages, disadvantages, questions regarding these proposed improvements. You don't like it, you like it, you have questions. Uh, anybody can go in any order. I have one strong reaction um, that yes, we should improve the pedestrian crossing at Page Mill and um, El Camino and Oregon, mm -hmm. um, but I don't think there's any point in improving the bicycle crossing there because I think we should direct bicycles to other ma ways to go north, south, east, west. Okay. I strongly agree with that. I have okay. a follow-up question. Mm -hmm. What exactly are the improvements supposed to look like? Well, I think that what this is suggesting is kind of the thrust of where we want to go to refine the improvements, but you know, that we'd want to improve bike or ped access there. So I don't know what the the proposals would look like. Um, they haven't been drawn up yet. Um, but if that's where we want to put our energy into focusing, we could kind of refine, well, what would improve bike and pedestrian access? What I'm hearing from at least three folks is they strongly support the pedestrian improvements, but don't think bikes should be on El Camino and I, I think maybe Oregon Expressway as well. And so therefore, maybe that not being so. Do you have any thoughts on it or? Uh, I, I agree with the comment about bikes shouldn't be there. I was just, I'm trying to imagine what an improved pedestrian crossing would look like there and I was just failing to imagine what it would look like. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a good idea how to get there. I think there's more that can be um, done with marking on the roadway or how you um, uh, allow for bikes to signal light changes. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of improvements that one could do in this area. Right now, it's, it's pretty um, generic. Um, but. Okay. Angela? Um, our group talking about the, um, the crossing at Ash, crossing Page Mill at Ash, we agreed that probably having another stoplight right there would slow down traffic on Page Mill or Oregon. Um, and so uh, if we want to improve traffic flow and if we're concerned about extra cars coming in with new residents, uh, a stoplight there might make things worse. However, we were talking about the little bridge idea um, which would not slow traffic down, hopefully, a bridge or an underpass. And I also thought it might be possible to make the all of Ash into like a bike pedestrian um, boulevard, I guess, um, all the way to California Avenue um, to, uh, to direct cars away from Ash. And uh, I mean, not 100%, but... Um, but semi-restrict car access to Ash and make it a, a nice access road all the way to California Avenue. Great, that's a great idea. Other comments? So it seems to me that if we're trying, if we're doing the, um, uh, what do you call it? The transportation? Mobility. Mobility, um, what do we call it? In the research park? I forgot the name of the official name of it. Transportation? Demand management. Demand management or the associate management association, Trans TMA. Management association. I think I heard comments on the council uh, that they haven't been able, they've been able to get the solo number of solo drivers um, to go down, but they have not been able to get the number of bicyclists to go up to the research park. So, and it seems to me one of the weak, weak points is that if, you, if I go on Caltrain and t take my bicycle, Getting across El Camino is, is difficult. Even at California Avenue, it's not ideal. You're you're fighting with buses um, and a lot of backed up cars. Um, uh, so I, I think that that should be a consideration as well. I mean, we we have a larger goal in the research park, um, and so that may, to me that may mean having a bicycle improvement at that location, even though I understand why people are uncomfortable with it. Well, I have a hard time thinking about specific intersections because I tend to think more about the network. And so if we're saying, I'm not saying no to bicycles crossing El Camino, I'm saying let's design bicycles crossing El Camino somewhere. And that's, I found this later slide where we have 
a network of streaks much more interesting to say, hey, let's prioritize bikes on this section mm -hmm. of the network. Not to say cars can't go on it, but it might feel more difficult for cars to go on it because of narrowness or whatever. And other sections we say, okay, yeah, you, you're welcome here, cars, by the way we design the streets. So it sounds like maybe part of the kind of between the two of your comments is kind of thinking about how do we make sure that the network, people can get where they want to go and maybe it, whether it's at El Camino, is that the desire point where the cyclists, let's say the example from the Caltrain want to cross, is it another desire point to cross that might be safer or more advisable because we're able to limit vehicles and so that becomes a preference. But thinking about the network and thinking about the larger connectivity that folks going not only to the NVCAP area but through the NVCAP area to other adjacent places. And it might also, um, a way to think about it is that in areas where we have high housing density, um, there's more car, pedestrian, bicycle conflict and areas such as Olive and Pepper, they're actually an opportunity where we have lower density and might be an area that bicycles would be welcome and cars will, would not be because it would help solve that sort of cut through issue that Olive and Pepper hate so much. Mm -hmm. That's great. Angel, do you have some? Yeah, um, what is the street right opposite Hanson? Because Hanson is the one that leads Portage. into the- Portage? Yeah, so maybe from Portage or from um, Olive across El Camino, um, just to have a, a bike crossing there might be a useful thing. Crossing El Camino from Portage or um, Olive or to Hanson. Acacia. Or Acacia, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Basically, let's get try to get the folks to places that are maybe a little so safer for them to cross. Yeah. Uh, sounds like we're like, this street or this street or this street, and not that one. All right, I'm gonna move on to the next slide unless there's any comments on this one. We're good. All right. So this one is a vision for El Camino, Oregon Expressway from Grand Boulevard, Palo Alto Safety Study. It's a little hard to see because it's taken from another plan um, for El Camino. And Sylvia, I know I'm going to put you on the spot because you may know a little bit about this to help us to understand it, especially because the graphic is not the world's best. Um, do you mind just either, you could either come here or use the mic just to say a little bit about what this is and kind of how it, it might be designed to help improve the intersection. transportation programs planning manager for the city um, so this is from a study that was done uh, through a grant process um, these plans were presented to the Planning Commission and I haven't moved any further than that um, there was some community outreach that was done to try to figure out how we could how Palo Alto could potentially make um, bicycling and transit work better in the area around California Avenue and El Camino. So this um, particular excerpt is showing Page Mill Road here and El Camino here. And this um, is, I think, showing the Q bus lanes. Mm -hmm. So the red lanes are Q, uh, sorry, are bus Q jump lanes. Um, and the green would be cross bikes and bike facilities to help kind of make it a little easier for bikes to get um, some of the locations here. So I'm not gonna, I don't wanna talk a lot about this, but um, just know that there are ways and people can imagine how to make these streets better for pedestrians and bicyclists and cars and buses. Um, one, I know that VTA and I think it's, I guess it's just VTA, would be interested, here we go, would be interested in improving speeds along El Camino. Um, and also, just so you know, Mountain View has recently um, adopted plans to improve bicycling along certain stretches of El Camino because bicycles want to go to businesses that exist. El Camino. Um, so. Where do the bicycles go on El Camino? I sort of see the little green dots disappearing and then appearing again. And, <laughs> and where, are they supposed to go on the sidewalk, or um, are, is there a bike lane, or is there are they riding in the uh, next to the parking parked cars? Or yeah, so yeah. 
so this isn't a this isn't really a plan for continuous bike lanes. It's just to kind of help people who need to get to something at El Camino get to the get to where they're going. So there are some people who currently ride on the sidewalks, you know, at on Oregon. Um, and then this would just be to help them get. Actually, this is showing. This may be showing a protected bike lane. So that was one of the concepts that they came up with in this thought experiment. So this actually shows, um, this actually yeah. does show protected bike lanes, separated protected bike lanes. For areas? Just, just, yeah, for certain areas. Yeah. But again, just kind of, I think, is still just saying some inspiration to, to think about. We don't have to like or dislike this, but it's ways to think about how to solve that, that challenge. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, and this grant was actually given to us and to Redwood City because of the high number of collisions um, that were happening um, in the vicinity of Calav. Um, bicyclists are, are getting hit because bicyclists are riding there. So I know that we have people who feel like bicyclists shouldn't ride there, but some people have to ride there because that's where they have to go. Maybe that's how they have to work. So how they get to get how they have to get to work. So that's why. Excuse me, I have a quick question. I, this is a recent amendment to the original Grand Boulevard plan, or is this part of the original Grand Boulevard adopted plan? I think this was fun. I'm not exactly sure who funded this. I think it was Caltrans, actually, who, was, who funded this, because it's a, it's a Caltrans thing. But um, uh, there, there was no amendment that was made. This was just a plan, it right. and we haven't it's adopted it. It's right. not gone to council. It's just an idea. Yes, this stretch, yes, went from hand, yes. Mm -hmm. so maybe something we can look at for some more inspiration. So the next um, slide is around Park Boulevard. So the, again, the dark blue are the considerations. Um, I'm gonna go from the add left turn signal phase. So that's, uh, I think that's at Pepper. It would be the next street, I think. Oh, which no. is that? No, yeah, that's yeah. that's Page Mill. Sorry, yeah. that's Oregon. Sorry, I'm yeah. I'm like I'm just looking at the streets and like where what's the next street? But that's that's skipping over to Oregon. So okay. add left signal phase. This is kind of what we were just talking about a little. Well, there's a, there was a signal at Ash. This would be adding a signal at Park uh, onto Oregon on ramp. Additional studies were required, and there's limited right of way to do that. So it'd be adding a, a left turn signal phase there, skipping over to the uh, consolidate driveways with future development. So part of the challenge with Park Boulevard being a bike boulevard, or one of the things that could make it more bike friendly would be to have fewer driveway aprons so that there's fewer conflicts of cars exiting onto Park Boulevard and having conflict with cyclists and pedestrians. Um, the north side of Park Boulevard uh, is one suggestion of where that could possibly happen to minimize the conflicts. And then portage extension. So one potential way to reconnect the grid and the connectivity in the NVCAP area is to have portage extend all the way through to Park Boulevard. There's been some discussion, you know, should that be for cars, bikes, should that be for just pedestrians? What it, would it mean to reconnect that portage extension and would there be a signal there at Park so that um, folks turning uh, onto or off of portage on Park Boulevard and Park Boulevard, excuse me, would um, have a signal to monitor and move that, monitor those movements. So just take a second, a few minutes again, what you see as advantages of these proposals, what are the disadvantages, and then we'll just come back together in a minute and talk about that.
Okay. All right, thoughts from folks. We'll come back together as a group. Thoughts on these uh, proposals, left turn signal, consolidate driveways and the portage extension. Who wants to start? Possibly everybody heard my opinion already since I was so loud. But um, number one, um, I everyone else is just do. quiet. That's all. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, um, Parker suggested a long time ago that we make that uh, Park Oregon uh, light a three way light so that when you're moving from uh, on park um, from the NVCAP area towards California Avenue, um, you would be able to turn left as much as you wanted because you would have a green signal and those people going the opposite way would have a red signal. Um, and uh, yeah, and then you would just, you wouldn't have to wait forever for that, uh, for the, the people coming the opposite way on park to turn left on it during busy times of day, which it gets crazy. And there's not enough room um, to put a left turn lane there, we've discovered. So, um, so yeah, a three-way signal would be great. And then uh, since we want to keep Park a really good street for biking, especially if we're considering um, uh, people coming from the train station, and it already is a, a bicycle boulevard, um, and we'd like to keep it safe for bikes, um, making Portage a through street from El Camino would just encourage cut throughs. Um, and, uh, and we just want to avoid that. So certainly improve the egress and ingress, but but from opposite sides, from Park, from El Camino, but not all the way through. That's my opinion. Okay, other thoughts? Kirsten? So we have a lot of streets going in and out of this neighborhood, and we have two modalities of transportation that are challenging when they share. Um, and so I, I think one concept might be that I, I like, <laughs> is that all of the single family home is bike prioritized. The next one might be car prioritized. The next one might be bike prioritized. Now we're up to Portage and we're, uh, well, we just passed Portage. So that's a bike prioritized one, but might go all the way through to accommodate that Stanford Research Park traffic and also the schools in Barron Park. And then um, that I believe it's not listed out here, but the one after Port Lambert uh, might be a car prioritized, and that's mo largely a commercial street. So it might be a nice parallel because it brings the commercial traffic to the commercial streets and uh, bicycle traffic Lambert. more. T this is Lambert, yeah, the unlabeled one, I think. Um, and it might be a way that we could uh, accommodate kind of getting the, tra the, the neighborhood to breathe out onto El Camino mm. in it you know, the cars breathe out on El Camino and the bikes breathe up to Park Boulevard, you know, as they exit. Great, so it's kind of an alternating pattern and yeah. kind of having some streets that would be more car, car centric and others that might be more well, bike Well, I think with focused. the street design, you can allow a car to go down it, but it's not possible for a car to go very quickly down it. I live on, in, on Matadero in, in Ventura and it's very narrow and the cars just have to wait for each other. Mm -hmm, yeah, queuing street strategy. Uh, Tim, I don't know if you or a Sprout organization have thoughts about extending portage through. Um, you know, we've heard, again, some people thinking how to make sure it's not cut through, but I don't know what, what your, you guys have thought about that or have opinions about, about it. Or... <laughs> creek gets naturalized, that side of the property becomes very, very small or almost non-existent, depending on how big that shoulder is. So then that, that has a negative effect on our ability to make portage through, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so we kind of, if there's development on both sides of portage, then w I think we could look at a way to um, quiet the street and make it very uncomfortable for a car to go very fast and uh, prioritize bicycles and pedestrians, whichever is more appropriate depending on what development is around it. So it, in itself, you can't answer the question. Uh, you have to kind of look at the, the larger plan and, and how it fits within the plan. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. 
<laughs> like I said, that's what we always say. Um, and it's not trying to be evasive, it's just the truth. Um, so if you look at the, <laughs> if you look at like um, to Kristen's point that, or Kristen's point that um, I think Lambert is also wider than Portage. So it actually makes it, that actually may make things easier. But then you would have to change the light at El Camino. I think one of the, the I think one of the reasons the conversation about portage being pushed through uh, at some point and con connected is there's a fair amount of uh, city utilities that go through there, and to relocate them would be extremely expensive, and you can't build on top of them. So, what's the better uh, long-term view of it is to go ahead and utilize it for some kind of circulation. Good information. Any other comments about other points on this page? I'm conscious it is 8.13, so I think we might have one more slide. Just seeing how many, we have quite a few more. Okay, so we're not gonna get through them. Um, but what I can do is make sure to send out, again, the links with these, to these, um, to these presentations with these specific pages and the questions so that you can think through it particularly if there's something that you see as a really great opportunity or you're like, oh, this opportunity looks, you know, more like a challenge, um, we can kind of get those, those surfaced um, even outside of the, our, our meeting to get times in person. Okay, so since it is 814, and I'll just kind of go through what, what they are so you can kind of get a sense of them. There are improvements suggested again for Portage Avenue, improvement at Portage and Hanson intersections, and ex again, the extension of Portage to Park, which we just talked a bit about. This is another slide from the Grand Boulevard, um, but it's the Portage Hanson intersection, which we kind of mentioned. Then we also have olive and pepper traffic calming. Um, there could be banning left turns from ash and onto ash from pepper or olive could be a way to calm traffic. So folks might not want to cut through there because they can't turn left and speed bumps. Do you have something, Dory? I think that Jonathan might remember if I'm wrong. I think that the Hanson Portage intersection is being fixed along with the Parmani Hotel project. Mm -hmm. So I think that's going to happen. Is that the case? Or just, just one side, though. Yeah, 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 just that side, yeah. Well, that's good to know. So that's partly being realized. Uh, and then, yeah, that's great. And then ash connector, um, extend ash from olive to acacia or portage, bike pet only. Um, again, an, another kind of idea for a portage connector. So similarly, so these orange lines are suggesting, you know, would it be ways to do bike or ped connections that provide site access, but but for bikes and pedestrians um, primarily or only. And then parking consideration, um, considering parking impacts created by new development that might happen um, in that kind of pepper olive uh, rectangle, quadrilateral, um, or the build out of the plan area, time limits on street parking, what other kind of policies that more relate to how cars park and stay at this space, not so much, they, they relate to the built environment, certainly, in terms of how much parking is required in developments, but also how do we wanna use our street parking and our public space um, for parking of cars, for what lengths of time and under what conditions. This is a saucepan. <laughs> this is a saucepan, yes. Yeah, that's probably <laughs> the shape of that. that I don't know, that's saucepan. Um, that's there with the pepper, olive, ash, uh, and park boulevard. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna close this part of the meeting and we're gonna move into our oral communications portion. Are there any speaker cards, Chitra? Yes, we have two speaker cards. Uh, first is uh, Sadvigdina. I can't pronounce the last name. <laughs> Um, it's beautiful, though. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, uh, I wanted to say a couple things. Some of them, I think, were covered. Um, uh, but, um, yeah, Park Boulevard is a really crucial bicycle route. Um, it's really the only uh, efficient through route uh, west of uh, the tracks. 
Um, so it's really um, important that it be maintained as a safe uh, and efficient um, uh, uh, bike throughway. Um, and I'm concerned, I've been concerned for years that we're adding more and more development on uh, park and, and neglecting to address how that impacts the safety of bikes. Um, and, um, and let's see, in terms of, um, um, yeah, as, as was mentioned, yeah, there's a high rate of accidents of uh, uh, bikes being hit by cars rear-ended on El Camino. So that is actually an important uh, way to go. Um, so we, we need to improve the safety there. Um, I was kind of spacing out a little bit, so uh, I don't know if you mentioned, but one of the um, one of the ideas that was uh, uh, floated early on was the idea of putting a, a right turn only lane from northbound El Camino onto uh, eastbound Page Mill. So when you're going towards California Avenue from from the south, there'd be a right turn only lane because that's the cause of a lot of the cut through traffic. Um, and so uh, doing that would be an Im important um, thing for the neighbors as well as for safety of bikes on park. Um, and then the other f idea that was floated early on was uh, to make pepper and olive one way um, towards El Camino, again, to prevent that cut through traffic. So I think the, the, the right turn only as well as that um, together would, would be a big thing. Um, not a super fan of um, necessarily connecting uh, car traffic from El Camino to park because of that cut through traffic that we see already and it'll just make it easier and worse. Um, and then um, on uh, forms of buildings, uh, I was glad to see people saying they like balconies. Um, I, uh, I would like to see a lot of rooftop gardens. I think all roofs should be either a rooftop garden or, and or solar uh, or wind or a, a highly reflective roof to radiate heat back out into space. So the cool roof uh, are an effective strategy for uh, cooling the planet. Um, but but I, I think uh, uh, rooftop gardens is really a, the, the best use um, for most of that space um, for people as well as for um, all of the um, animals that are um, in decline, the birds and the bees. Um, so it could really be a, a, a habitat um, a boon to have a lot more roofs, have um, gardens with... Uh, native plants um, and then also it, it's great for um, residents to have access to private open space um, in these areas that could have a lot of density but you're all kind of cheek to jowl but really people need to be able to get outside and um, enjoy space so I think rooftop gardens and stepped buildings is a great way to do that um, and then I would encourage public space where people can can gather without the need to spend money in order to participate so often we say, oh, we gotta have a cafe and a, and a bar, you know, but then that requires you to spend money out there. And not everybody has a lot of money, uh, but they're still part of the community and still important. Um, and, uh, da -da 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 -da. and then uh, I, I think it's important that we um, get the, m the ratio of housing to commercial correct, uh, is specifically office. Um, so I, I think it's great to have uh, shops, um, maybe some, um, office, but uh, Palo Alto has been uh, perennially jobs, housing, and balance. I think it was something, I forget now my numbers, but the, uh, well the, the good ratio to maintain the balance is something like, is it eight to one or four to one of, uh, it was something like 100 square feet per worker, but you need like three or 300 square feet to live in uh, at a minimum. So um, so three or four to one of housing to office will help to prevent the worsening imbalance. Um, all right, I guess I'll leave it at that. Um, I guess uh, I would just encourage us to do also, you know, green infrastructure uh, throughout the site, throughout the city, but throughout the site, um, water capture, uh, water uh, processing on site. It's a large enough site that it could be effectively um, at scale. You could do, um, um, like uh, you know, living machines uh, type of things to process uh, water in, in a way that people, it's not an ick factor, it's a, it's a beautiful factor of um, you know, be, be engaged with our, our water infrastructure. All right, thanks. Great. Let's see the next speaker. Thank our next you. Speaker, Karen.
good evening and thank you all. Um, lots of really good comments and work tonight and uh, appreciate that. And Chitra, hats off. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you. <laughs> it looks like a, not only a lot of work but really valuable work. So um, I look forward to seeing it and bless you. Um, a lot of I, everything I think that Cedric said about uh, circulation, I would agree with. And there's one thing that I just want to like put out there. I'm not advocating for anything about this, but just want to put it out there. Is there's this thing that exists in Palo Alto, and it seems like something nobody ever wants to talk about. When it comes up, people just kind of go, "Oh yeah, well." Um, and that's there is actually an existing, and Sylvia will know about this. There is an existing undercrossing under El Camino at Page Mill. And I've been told the farthest I ever get with anybody, once I finally discovered that it was there, is, well, it's not ADA accessible. Well, it's not in good condition. But then it never goes beyond that. It's like we have alligators down there or something, you know? It's like nobody wants to talk about it. And uh, well, that, so maybe tonight we'll get an answer to that. But, um, uh, but, you know, it seems like if it's something that exists, it's like, what would it take to make it functional? Because getting across El Camino is is a big challenge. Um, I appreciate what Alex said about, and I've forgotten which development you referred to, but one where you said um, uh, that one big building on the block that was kind of monolithic, it's, uh, it's too big and too, ver too um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but oppressive, but it's sameness, so it's like boring, and you said the same thing about these long uh, facades that we have on El Camino. Um, they're not granular. And this neighborhood um, expects, not the people even, the development that's existing there now, expects a more granular kind of development. And when you start getting to longer block faces or uh, denser, larger buildings as opposed to smaller buildings that would accomplish density, you're cutting out opportunities for plantings, trees, um, green space, and all of those are environmental elements uh, that help provide, as Cedric said, places for birds and people too, as well as environmental advantages. So um, just a few comments, but thank you all. Good work tonight. And Chitra, you're my new heroine. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I know she's going to be in demand for her research. Do you have something? Oh, did Sylvia, do you want to talk about the tunnel a little bit? Just because I think we're all interested. Yeah. Yeah, this came up this year at one of the budget committee meetings. Someone asked a, someone on the council, I think, asked a question, and uh, someone in public was John, John Haas, uh, is the only one who had the answer, um, because he used to be the one who would go down every time it rains to clean it out. Um, so there is, uh, there are, I think it's stairs, you go down, there's an undercrossing, and then the stairs come up. Um, but it basically, yeah, it's not ADA accessible, it's a maintenance nightmare um, every time it rains. Um, and we, it's been closed. It's not. It, I mean, yeah, maybe it's just an issue of, of money, but um, public works, public works, right, yeah, public works folks were not excited about the concept of reopening that because of the flooding problems. It certainly seems like something to think about for us as we kind of are visioning about what to do in the future, that if it could be become something. I don't know that it's the same thing. I asked Jonathan, I think, to give me a, okay. Um, I'm not saying it's the same thing, but there uh, has been perennially, uh, until the last handful of years, and then recently there's been a, a little backsliding going on, but the undercrossing, as you come down Alma, then to get on, you know, that always floods, that always, always, always floods, until Joe Samidian said, <laughs> can't we fix this? And indeed it got fixed, so it doesn't flood anymore, except there was a little backsliding, you know, with a, an equipment failure, but that doesn't flood anymore for the last good handful of years. It just seems like, I don't have the answer, I'm not an engineer, but rather than just saying, oh, it floods, and I'm not, not picking on you, don't take it that way, uh, rather than just saying, oh, it floods and it's not ADA, and, what would it take for it to not do that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah right, an hydrology study of the, of the undercrossing. Rachel, just anecdotally, in not too long ago, there was a developer that wanted to restore that as a public benefit for a project. 
So it could, yeah, it could go that could route. be happen. It was Jim Bear, and you're right. I was just going to say that. Okay, so it's 827. Uh, last thing that I want to ask for folks, you know, this is, I think, my first time chairing this meeting or facilitating this meeting uh, without Elena and limited support. <laughs> Am I fishing for compliments so hard? I'm just kidding. Um, but I do, and also our first time with our co-chairs helping to plan the meeting. So I would just like to ask quick shout outs, what worked well about the meeting and what could be improved for next time? So again, what worked well and what could we improve for next time? We'll start with the things that went well. I think the small group breakouts that were very short duration, that weren't, were, were very bite-sized as far as the feedback that you were asking for us, worked very well, very clear buildup, no, but not overly long buildup, and then time to talk and think and give you feedback. Great. And I feel time has come short of our other time, so we know it was time to move on to the next topic. Great. Yeah. Other things that worked well today? Yeah, I think you kept us engaged and looking at examples and going through things was helpful. Awesome. I don't think we need the consultants anymore. <laughs> I, I, I beg to differ, but I like the sentiment. <laughs> we should have said that before we went to council, save us a bunch of money. All right. <laughs> okay, what could be improved for next time? What would we want to improve for our next meeting? Can we clone you? Um, I'm working on it, but I don't think it'll be ready in time. <laughs> for some future generation. There we go. Anything that could be improved for next time. I sort of feel like we're back on track, and a, lo a lot of this was sort of reviewing stuff, but we had kind of maybe lost track of how we started this process before, and this I very much appreciate, because I was going to do this myself, actually, because I wanted it, just in one place so I didn't have to look everything up each time separately. And we have all this information on our open data, but it's just not consolidated, which is a lot of work. So, And I, some of us don't know how to find it. <laughs> it's not easy. Um, so I think we're on a good track. I think we have to have some really hard conversations about what we can actually achieve in this area, especially given the preferences of some of the large property owners. And um, I'm thinking about Lakiba Pittman's letter and what we want to do with that area. Because from my perspective, if we upzoned Pepper and Olive, that would be the first thing to be redeveloped. And I think maybe some people want that, but I think we have to have a pretty big discussion about that because the other largely commercial properties are not going to turn over quickly, I don't think, to become um, residential. So I think, you know, we have what we have. So I think the big, I personally have a strong, I have a preference about olive and pepper and, but it may not be what everybody wants, but I think we need to have a strong discussion about that and about the actual park incorporating the um, creek improvements into Bull Park, Bull Ware or Bull Ware? I always forget which is which. And also, I think the bike improvements are very, very important. That whole exchange, I don't know what to do it about it exactly, but the on and off to Page Mill from Park is very dangerous and off-putting for pedestrians and bikes. So I think we should be realistic and try and try to get as much done as we can quickly, understanding that I don't see this area as a blank slate. So I think we have to be realistic about that. Yeah, I think that's great. I think part of what we want to have in our next meeting is those hard conversations about trade-offs. We don't want to have them in a vacuum of just this or that or one thing or the other because it would that it were such an easy seesaw, but it's much more of a complex system where as we begin to work on one part, many other parts are affected and changed. And so we want to work with our, our consultants to think about how do we realize some of the options that are before us so we can kind of tease out, you know, these trade-offs and, you know, think creatively about, you know, how we want to, you know, pursue parkland and open space and what's the trade-off for height or density that we might make that might give us more open space but a little bit taller building 
but is that something we'd want to do or some of the other uh, trade-offs that we can make? Okay, it's 8.32. A, a quick Keith, question. That, mm -hmm. uh, has there been any outreach to the landowners on all of Endeavor? Do we know what they really think? We anecdotal. Yeah, that some people have remarked. A lot of the properties are actually pretty consolidated on some of the streets into a couple owners, and then there are um, several single-family home owners who live there who we have outreach to. If I think there's only a handful, and I believe we have reached out. Part of it was under Elena's tenure, so Chitra may know more about that. But it's also a group that we can get a hold of because it's not too big, too. So it's manageable we, to. We know where they live. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we can do that. So I, I, I think it would be useful to have a comprehensive outreach so we know what they think. Yeah. And that would help guide our decision. Yeah. I think um, for, for Pepper, we are all individuals uh, residents. So if they are also still going by different people. Mm -hmm. What's uh -huh. wrong with it's all, it's all of it's consolidated. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah there it is. Yes. Right, right, right. So, but yeah, there's it's still not a gigantic group of people that we could still we could still do outreach so that would be great all right so i know it's 8 30 it's 8 33 now um the last thing is we have some halloween candy if you would like some halloween candy from my desk to your your tummy uh please take some and have a safe and happy halloween bottom of the ninth inning seven to two washington